Thank you so much for the invitation to talk about this uh, fantastic uh, topic. Uh, what could be more relevant in, in today's uh, real world than, than talking about our food's journey? Uh, my name is Henning. I'm heading a division of food technology at the Technical University in Denmark. Um, amazingly, food technology in, in, in this university setting is becoming more and more or pulling more and more towards, uh, what should I say, the digital world. There seems to be a, a merge here, which is quite interesting. I didn't see that five years ago, I have to admit but it's getting stronger and stronger and we're actually recruiting professors just to address this issue of the technology and, and the digitalization going on. So that is just to explain a bit about why am I talking about blockchain when I'm in food technology. First of all, there's, um, I'll try to address five issues here in my talk. It, the, my slides may not be that well structured because I was a bit confused this morning about the timing. Sorry, Nuri, it's, uh, it's, it's just a busy world these days. So mm -hmm. I'll talk a bit about our food chain and how it's broken. I'll talk about how I see blockchain develops and it's developing very rapidly as I see it. I'll talk a bit about who use it and I'll give some illustrations about who use it in the food sector. And then I'll briefly touch upon some learnings from a project that we run from uh, approximately a year ago, finished a year ago, which was at particularly addressing the needs for the many, many small and medium food companies. Uh, and we have to remember that it's like, if we take about registration, it's like 98% of all food companies in Europe are small and medium enterprises. That, of course, covers everything from a one person butcher shop to, to the big multinationals we have. So, but nevertheless, that just underlined that SMEs are important. Finally, I try to close by some reflections on the future. And if I'm talking about something that the summer school have already discussed in details, please just tell me I don't want to spend people's time on something you have already dealt with. So, so uh, help me here. Okay. Right, the block, the, the food chain. Can I change? Why can't I change? There, okay. Um, this is what I will want to talk about. Uh, I talked to a very high ranking uh, person in, uh, in a country I don't want to mention here. And he said, our food chains are fucking broken. Normally I don't swear, but I'm just quoting him. And I think there is some truth here because our food chains are actually global. A lot of our food chains are global. But as you can see, the, the concept of a chain is that it's interlinked. So, Actually, this is not a food chain because it's going through so many steps, changing hands, changing operator, being processed, being transported, going through another uh, um, means of processing. So we don't really have many well-functioning chains. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, historical reasons the way our chains have developed and so forth we are but but uh, but let me dwell into some of them when you have broken chains from my point of view there are several challenges i've just listed some of them here uh, one of them um, we'll dive further into but let me just mention one here there is a strong, still a strong paper-based bureaucracy when we transport food and food elements, items in our world. Par parallel to that, we are diving head on into a very digital world, but our food is still being handled in a very paper-based world. Um, it, it's being seen partly if you follow the media and see what's going on in the UK, 
the UK are complaining about lack of foods on the shelves. Why is that? Oh, it's because it's a lack of drivers, truck drivers. Uh, this is just cut uh, from the BBC News uh, some last week. Uh, and they're taking all kinds of actions to get more truck drivers to work in the Euro UK. What came out in this story is actually that it's partly because the, the, the drivers, the truck drivers, doesn't want all the bureaucracy of transporting from, I mean, across the, the, the channel into the UK. Uh, because they may spend um, eight hours sitting there trying to fill out all the paper forms uh, crossing the channel. And I think it's a very interesting illustration about what we see in the in the stores, we think that, oh, but why don't we get our oranges or milk or whatever it's, there's a shortage of? Uh, right now, McDonald's cannot uh, serve, uh, what is that, milkshakes? And that was a big story. I mean, I th honestly think we can survive without milkshakes, but, uh, but nevertheless, that was the story that caused uh, me to drive, dive into this. So, Fraud is another issue. We are handling fraud, or should I say alteration, uh, in a very old fashioned way by, by going, having control, physical control at the various supermarkets or at the companies and so forth. And uh, I just picked uh, an old slide I made some a couple of years ago, and that was just to say what what did we actually find out in the EU in 19, 2019? There's all kind of of illustrations here. It's meat, it's fish, it's olive oil, it's uh, wine, sausages. What surprised me here is because until then I have talked about it's valuable products, it's up market products that is worth uh, somehow fiddling with. But a lot of these items are not actually that high value. Yes, food, fish, olive oil, meat, uh, herbs, eggs, so forth. Yes, it's a very important part of our diet. Uh, and it's, it's uh, but it's not more than normal. It's not like you pay the like, 50 euros for a, a bottle of wine. It's basic food stuff. Nevertheless, there's a lot of fraud here and we are doing that in a very old fashioned way, controlling that or trying to control it. This is just an illustration about what kind of things are being uh, fumbling around with everything from cereals to flavors to functional foods. Uh, the Danish authorities this year are focusing a lot of oregano, uh, uh, which is a, a, a normal herb we use every day in our dishes. Uh, nevertheless, there's a lot of uh, issues going on here. Let me dwell a bit about what, and you have heard this, I'm sure you heard this, blockchain. It came out um, as the solution to everything. Then it certainly three years ago disappeared from the agenda completely, it, partly because it was linked to this whole uh, issue of uh, Bitcoin. Uh, blockchain is basically just uh, a record of actions. I hope you have been into details of this because then I will not spend a lot of time on it. Um, because blockchain is also changing the way it's working this month. Uh, the original discussion where it was, was, is it centralized or is it a decentralized chain? Um, I think we will see all kind of, we are seeing all kind of variations of this. Some of what is being pre presented as a blockchain today is actually uh, partly centralized. And I don't see that as actually an issue. Um, what is important here that it can help us validate the transaction. That is the key message of blockchain. It can help us validate the transaction or the validity of the transaction. 
simply by recording it. We can never in a paper-based world go back in the same way and validate those transactions. It's simply too uh, labor costly. Uh, we see it when we have the kind of a safety issue in the Danish uh, system where we have to re recall an issue from the, from the groceries. Uh, it could be some nuts with a too high uh, content of something. It takes weeks to get them back. If we had this transaction of by recording, we would know exactly what shop, at what time, where to look. We can't do that today. Um, companies, big companies are moving in here. Uh, it's like uh, three years ago, IBM launched their first uh, traceability platform for small and medium companies. It's been live now for three years. Uh, a lot of the big actors like SAP, Deloitte and others are moving uh, quite actively here. Uh, so, so solutions are out there. Uh, at least solutions for fairly simply, simple uh, food chains. And by simple, I mean, Yet I have not seen a blockchain that can really handle when people are really, uh, what is that, uh, the word for that, when you mix it, like uh, if you make a chocolate bar based on different uh, ingredients and mix it, it's, that is uh, an issue that is still uh, not really convincingly solved, I think. Uh, some of the big players started to move some three years ago. Uh, we interviewed uh, the innovation officer at, at Walmart. Um, what is that? That is two years ago. And he said clearly, traceability is just, is just the way we started. We can trace any of our products now. They, they are using an IBM solution, working closely with IBM, but there are other um, solutions out there. The reason for them to work so heavily with blockchain was actually because it's a resource optimization issue, not to convince the consumers actually, but they could really optimize their, their flow of products to the specific uh, outlets in a much more efficient way. And he said that in that way, they sold million, millions of dollars every day simply because they were sure that there. As an example, the apples and mangoes, they, they reach in the right state to the shop. So they were not overripe or under, what is the word, unripe, whatever it's called, <clears throat> but was just there at the right time. And if they could see the transport uh, uh, interfered with that, they could direct it to another uh, place. Almost at the same time, the grocery stores in, in Europe started to move. Uh, Carrefour was what the first one I saw in Europe really moving here. Um, and, and they are taking fairly simple products like milk, egg, poultry meat, which is not processed too much. Uh, and, and the consumer can see in the shop where it comes from. Is it indeed the high value product we are paying for? So trustability, or what should I say? The, the credibility among the consumers are clearly part of the reason for some people to, uh, some companies to move. I would like to show a small video, but because I misunderstood the timing here and I have people waiting at my doorstep, uh, I'll just refer it to yourself to go at the YouTube and try to see the story of Bumblebee Foods and how they use SAP block technology to track uh, tuna, freshly, freshly caught tuna in a sustainable fashion. And that is the key word, sustainable caught fish tuna uh, at the Philippines or was it Indonesia brought to the consumer in the UK. The consumer is looking for it. The fisherman is happy for it. Everybody seems to be happy in this story. What I want you to reflect on in this story is 
we do have the technology to do exactly this, that is to show where does the food come from. The key question here is who's, who's benefiting from this? Who's earning? Who, who, who have the motivation to go into this? And that reflects back to a learning I'll come back to later. Apparently, everybody is smiling all over the face on these happy big smiles all over the face when you see this video. But some will be earning more than others. And that is the question that always is behind creating a value chain, a blockchain, who have the motivation to go into it. Uh, there was a professor at, uh, at um, we met in, in the Silicon Valley who underlined that that is almost uh, one and a half year ago. And he said that he thought personally, his perception was that the technology was pretty ripe. So to implement te the technology, was 20% of the effort. But to have the whole uh, negotiation among the stakeholders were 80% of the effort. 80% of the effort. It's not the technology anymore. It's about people. It's about convincing them why should they make the effort to upload data, to share their data, to participate in this. So that's why I want you to reflect on when you see a blockchain, who's earning here? So, so there is a, a link here, you can, uh, but you just uh, make a search on Bumblebee, uh, Seafoods, uh, and you'll definitely, you, there are several slides, several, several um, what is that called? Videos at, at YouTube, uh, three to three minutes and you're done. It's, it's a beautiful uh, video. So things are moving rapidly. Companies are investing. Uh, authorities are looking for solutions. Uh, consumers are looking for uh, transparency and documentation. How is it going in the small Danish food sector? The Danish food sector is dominated by few big ones, like big dairy companies like Arla or Slaughter, houses like a Danish Crown, and a lot of small, medium companies. Can they participate in this or will they be sidetracked? That was the, basically the question we asked in this uh, small project, which was uh, supported by the Danish Industry Foundation, uh, with the aim of trying to find out, can the Danish uh, small, and medium food companies benefit from this. And I'll try to give you some learnings from that. Um, we interviewed a lot of companies. We tried to present solutions, uh, find barriers to entering this. Um, and that was really a learning trip for me. Uh, the key feature is, just to mention a few, is that they are actually not using block technology. A lot of the SMEs are using good old fashioned paper and pencil for bookkeeping, for exporting, for everything. They have an elderly lady sitting in the back office handling all these things. She's been there for 15 years. She knows nothing about blockchain. And uh, the company is run by a person that knows nothing about uh, blockchain, typically uh, a, bill, a very skilled person who are really passionate about their product, but they are not digital. And uh, there's a long way from some of them to go there. We wanted this to be explorative. So we asked the companies, we have really in depth interviews with them say, if you want to go this way and protect your product, and remember, some of these companies are really producing high value products. It is indeed high value. It's uh, some of them are on the global market exporting to, uh, to some of the Michelin like restaurants in, let's say, Asia. That is a real case. Uh, we have uh, 
we have some that is really producing biscuits, for, uh, also for the Asian market, being out competing because of uh, plagueism uh, and so forth. So basically, it is high value products. Um, do they see the need? Yes, they do see the need, but they don't know how to handle it. They don't know how to address it. They are so focused on their business, on producing. Um, and 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 producing and and getting to the market that that uh, they don't have the skills and resources to go into it. Uh, we wanted somehow to see if we could design a solution to this, and we wanted to take in all available international knowledge uh, from across the world, and it included. Uh, in, in our case, we went to the Silicon Valley because there was some uh, fairs that we could lean on. So that was. Uh, uh, a thing. What we saw at that time, that's one and a half year ago, is a lot of companies are already there. They are working with blockchain. I can say the same thing about Danish uh, companies, but they don't talk about it. So I have not put their <laughs> logo here because they don't really want to talk about it. It's, it's interesting. Others are open about it. Um, I mentioned Walmart earlier, Bumblebee is down here and so forth. There's a lot of other companies. And in the, these one and a half years, things are moving rapidly. Nestle is a strong actor right now because they are really trying to protect and they are very, what should I say, uh, cautious about their product because if they have, and they have to be trust, trusty in their, in their suppliers. So I already said something about high value and what we learned about it. Then I would also say that what we learned was that what we thought was just simple blockchain solutions are merging with all kinds of other solutions these days. And I think in a couple of years, we'll see blockchain solutions from different companies like, well, it's IBM or SAP or Deloitte or others. They can start to talk together. So I. I honestly believe that the choices we make today may not be more, what should I say? It's, it's, it's like, uh, it will be like a car on four wheels, whether it's a Toyota or it's a Citroen, it, it does the same thing and it can start to talk together. So smart contracts were high on the agenda for those companies we talked about because they were really having problems with, with, um, Court issues about deliverables and so forth. One of the companies we're talking about is very interested in tokens, the issue of token. How can they uh, get the consumer to support uh, their producer? Uh, artificial intelligence obviously is, is uh, moving rapidly there. At the time, we saw you, the USA and China seems to lead the development, uh, but I have to say that uh, others are definitely moving. We saw a company from Romania, and uh, we have, uh, I have been in, in close contact with companies in India and so forth. Others are definitely catching up, definitely. So they are competing for the same issue, producing slightly different solutions though. Um, prices are different. Um, but this, but the outcome is basically the same. We also met with some really fancy upstart starts in the Silicon Valley because they don't want to leave this market to Dupont, SAP, and IBM. There are definitely others trying to co conquer uh, their share of that market. Um, an interesting issue is the differences in consumer trusts. Uh, we can see the USA and the Danish uh, market uh, consumer trust, just to use that as two different cases. We could go into Europe, how that would be. It's very, very different. The Danish consumers are very trusting in their shops. So if they are used to buy it at, uh, in co-op as a, one of the big uh, retailers, they trust that if co-op say this is safe, they have done their work. Uh, you don't see the same approaches in, uh, in the US. There's a lot of less, less trusty. They need 
they're searching solutions um, so that the push for for transparency from the consumer side is bigger in the USA in the, than it is in Denmark. There was a, a study saying uh, that uh, 75 percent of all the consumers in the US actually request not only with request more transparency as to what is the food, how it how is it treated, where does it come from, and so forth and so forth. Um, the Danish food authorities, as an example, are just waiting to get into the blockchain and getting the retail into the blockchain. They have the solution ready. The, the, the retail do not want to go there. Thus, the food authorities are stuck with the old fashioned uh, um, testing, uh, going and testing, and then recall uh, issues. Uh, a big barrier, which we have clearly seen talking to companies, they don't want to share their data. They don't want to share that data. They are so afraid of sharing that and that they think, I might be a bit rude here, but they think that they are supposed to share the critical business data. That's not the way it is. You agree in a, in a, in a, in a solution, you agree on what data you share, and you, doesn't share, you don't share your most confidential uh, business-related uh, data, but you can, why, why can't you share data? And that is a cultural issue. I think there is a business culture here, which is interesting. And uh, not all companies are ready to move here. And then I said uh, also, and I said that earlier, that the, for simple food chains, solutions are ready, you can implement them, no big deal. The more compounded foods, uh, I still need to see them uh, operating in a proper way. So what's happening around us? Uh, one on a year, I can't show you what I have here. I have a, 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 a can of tuna. I'll try to illustrate it uh, of what is happening. One and a half year ago, when we talked to this uh, retail chain, Coop, it's a quite a big chain in Denmark. They say they were not interested in blockchain. They couldn't see the need for it. Five months later, the blockchain solution were on the shelf. And this is, this is a solution that means you can scan with your phone and you get your story about where this tune is caught, how it's treated and so forth. A bit like the video I wanted to show you from uh, Bumblebee. So companies may say one thing that one day, uh, a bit later, they see the need for moving. Um, I'm, I'm still looking into co-op and I haven't seen other products. So it's an issue whether this was just a test or what. We'll see about that. Then one of the most exciting thing I wanted to mention to you is, I have talked about this old fashioned paper thing. Um, this came out uh, in July this year in, in our daily, uh, daily news, uh, Politiken. Uh, we import a lot of cut flowers, fresh, uh, fresh uh, products from, from uh, Eastern Africa, Kenya in particular is leading here. Uh, on average, a cut, uh, what is that? A bucket of, of flowers goes through 30 steps from everything from tax, health, export, import, transport, and all that kind, requiring 80 pieces of papers to be filled out for that supply per uh, container, so to speak. Um, I'm very fond of, of this story because, uh, because uh, actually Eastern Africa, East Africa is moving heavily uh, or strongly on this digitalization agenda. And it's, it's just two years ago that they started to work on a uh, blockchain solution. It's being implemented now. It's being implemented now. And the funny thing is now the bridge say, we want the same thing, of course. It eliminates all these paperwork if you can find a proper solution. And they are going to expand as to what they say, to fish, coffee, tea, et cetera, all the many products coming out of East Africa. And I really think this will be a fantastic, interesting case, which we should follow closely. Uh, and it's going to have a big, uh, a big uh, impact on the European system too, if 
they can get this system operating smoothly. We're not just talking about food. We are talking some of the food uh, or the products from our food systems. This is uh, uh, cow uh, hides, which moves into fashion shoes. It's a Danish brand, Rockamore. Uh, I think uh, I'm not using these shoes myself. Uh, they're too costly and it wouldn't fit my food, food anyway. But, but they are, it's a high value product. Uh, women are getting them handmade for them. And now you can see uh, there is, um, what is it called? Uh, um, the, the same thing as was on the tuna, the, the coat. We could, you can see what farmer did the cow uh, come from? How is, has it been treated and so forth? And, uh, and you can also see things like the hides now having a value. I think this is an interesting thing because it's moving into fashion, it's moving into design, it's moving into uh, art. Uh, and there's a parallel product that I'm following, I'm partly associated with, where we can see this is coming in really fast. This is a story I, I have. Just a few slides left, Nuri, so, so uh, there will be time for questions, I hope, so people can challenge me with my uh, clear statements, because obviously I'm simplifying things a bit, just to be clear. Um, a, small, a, a small co op said we want to document uh, about how we food, fight food waste. We can't find the solution out there how we can document it so we are actually producing our own now so native preserve which is actually in the business for something else is now developing their own solution which is uh, partly blockchain to show their trans tra traceability and they also want to show their climate impact uh, so so different types of solution partly using blockchains with different purposes are emerging. And this is, this is something I've, I'm going to follow closely because uh, what an imagination they have. And they are clearly seeing that they need to document to whoever uh, gets, gets involved in their business what they're doing. One of the small startups we, work, we have worked closely with is called Twisted Leaf. Twisted leaf is based on a concept of using coffee leaves, making tea. Uh, if you have ever traveled in Ethiopia, you will probably have tasted this. It's, it's quite normal to make uh, tea out on, on coffee leaves. And uh, these two guys, they wanted to take that idea and uh, produce slightly different products, quite expensive, but really, really delicious and refreshing for the Danish market. And they are on the market today. Um, and they want to show to the consumer their, their what should I say, their, their chain. So they want a solution where they can, the consumer can look at this and see how charged their farmer, um, how he has operated, how he's benefiting from this business, etc. And they are, they are the company working with token, among other things. I'm really excited to see how that is going to have an impact. So the last question, the future. The future is always the most interesting issue here. Who's going to win? My, my question to you is, and I hope you reflect on that, is what does it take to win the loyalty of consumers today if you are a, a food company? I think, that let me just, uh, I can see people are reacting. I'm, I'll be very happy. Let me just finish in one minute and then I'll close my slides so I can see who's talking. Is it loyalty? Is it loyalty like in like an Apple product? So if people ever uh, have bought an Apple iPhone, they will stick to an iPhone because they believe that the company wants the good for them. Is it simply transparency? 
uh, Danish Crown is now trying to put, put uh, 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 what is it, develop a, a blockchain solution showing where their pork meat for the Chinese market, how it's produced, how it has been transported and so forth. Is it that kind of transparency? Uh, we are being met with our authorities with a strong need for document the sustainability impact or the carbon footprint, if I use that word, for each food item. And that's something we work on the next two years. We are part of the way, not all the way. Uh, is it that kind of uh, can, so, so capability for saying the food has this and this climate uh, footprint, is that the thing that's going to, to, to decide? Uh, so, so that was just three of the questions uh, I could see maybe have an impact on the future loyalty for our products. Maybe it's because I react that way. In another forum, I mean, I can see that companies are looking for board members uh, that know something about sustainability. ESG means environment, social, uh, and, and governance. So they, they are using these terms because that is where the, 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 um, the, the metrics are lying. That is an ESG. And many board members do not know anything about this. Uh, they are looking for, uh, for, for noble uh, persons going into the board to help the company somehow address the future in this context. And there may be others uh, that I'm not uh, thinking about here, but this was somehow an attempt to get an interesting discussion in the last 10 minutes. I hope I asked some questions that you want to reflect on and share with me, uh, because that's the most interesting part of the uh, presentation, that is when, when people ask uh, questions afterwards. Please. Anyway, I I have a question in this last slide related with ethics. I think that ethics will be a main driver for the future, mostly in this new generation of people that are vegan, but not vegan for healthy issues, are vegan because they are really concerned with sustainability, with animal suffering, with uh, the conditions, uh, how the food are produced in, in, in other countries. Uh, I think that uh, this is, uh, uh, or that will, could be uh, uh, a main driver for, for the consumers. And to demonstrate that the food are produced in a fair way, with, uh, without exploitation, without uh, slavery, uh, I think that uh, uh, this coin, uh, <clears throat> actually the, 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 there are uh, several uh, coins or several labels uh, that uh, uh, already that are, are operating in the market regarding the uh, fair trade, uh, etc. So, but yeah. I, I think that the extension of this concept of fair trade, uh, no slavery, good conditions, uh, 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 practices uh, that are sustainable or compatible with the environment will be, so the, all this ethics component will be a main driver in the, in the future. And, and we need That's to demonstrate agree, right? that the, and we need to demonstrate that the food are produced in that conditions. It's not easy. No, exactly. And that I think there's two issues in what you're saying, if I may interpret it. First of all, we need to be much better in, in uh, fact-based uh, labeling. I mean, to, to document the facts behind it. That's one thing. And I also think that what you're saying is this: the, the ethics things, we are, there is clearly a trust issue here. And how do we build trust? That, that is, to some degree, I see data behind it as an issue because we have, uh, I think we are seeing it to be a bit rude. I think at, at the current green transition, there is a number of companies, they are greenwashing too much. <laughs> and, and that can only be counteracted by, by factor, by data. Marta, you, you also wanted to contribute here. Sorry if I'm talking. No, it's okay. It's okay. In fact, I wanted to, to, to highlight uh, the fair trade, as, as Lorenzo already, already mentioned, that I think is also a, a driver for, for people no? to, to, let's say, to uh, trust any, any food 
industry or, or retailer or related. No, I think that that's quite 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 important together with environment and so on. And also, yeah, this um, interest in the new generations, particularly, but also in the old generations, about. Um, local producers as well and small producers and, and farmers that is a way somehow related with both um, fair trade in a way uh, supporting the local economy in another way and also um, yeah reducing the environmental impact of of any you know so, transportation so Martha, the etc. question is then how do we document these uh, labor how do well, you, how do you make them trustworthy I, I mean, we have a we have a discussion going on in Denmark, and I think it's quite it's a valid discussion. How can we trust that that this is organic? There's, it's certified organic, but can we trust it? And this issue, can we trust the label? I think that is going to uh, cling to our labels uh, for a long time. That's not an easy uh, way. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, trustability is is key here. Mm -hmm. You know that that you. I mean, you really can, and, and the information that is given to the consumers, because consumers are more and more um, concerned and, and want to be informed. And uh, yeah, I think from the food industry, the more they, they give, a, I mean, of course, certain information, not, not everything, as, as you were mentioning, um, the more information they will give to, to consumers, um, the better for the food industry, no? Because they yeah. will overcome I all these that, yeah. fake news and things like that, no? <laughs> but but it's a it's a challenge for the food. Uh, what should I say? The directors, the CEOs, because going yeah. from not sharing anything and just asking for trust to to believe that you get trust by sharing everything. Yeah, th that yeah, is yeah, the, yeah. that is a mind. Uh, what is that called? A, a shift in mindset. Um, and and the question is. Who dares to do it? Personally, yeah. personally, I think that those who dares to do it will be the winner in the coming market. But, but, but um, not everybody is ready to share everything. Yeah, I agree. And and also, yeah, related with this, as you were mentioning, that in some some cases, in and particularly, I mean, in, in our area, for example, food industry is quite traditional. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's difficult to engage them in something so innovative for them, you know. Is 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 difficult. But if they see, I think if they see the the benefits, you know, yeah, they they will they will engage with it. Thank you very much, Henry. It was a very nice presentation. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, may I ask you a couple of questions, Henning? I hope. Uh, good morning and thank you again for your, for your presentation. I have a couple of uh, questions uh, for you. Um, one is related uh, with uh, this balance between uh, sustainability, as you mentioned in your last slide. So the the seek for for high sustainability on the on the on the chains, and also for example the food safety. Because uh, yeah. when you use like uh, sell in bulk uh, or you transport in bulk the the products, so how do you feel also the the balance on this? So when you use your own packages to to, to buy your stuff so and then of course there is some kind of uh, you can open the, the the gate for problems on food safety also Absolutely. so how, how, how do you see the this this balance mm -hmm. and the second one is about the role of the regulators in all mm -hmm. in, the, in the whole story of, uh, of 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 all these issues that you pointed very well in your presentation mm -hmm. Thank you, Hugo. It's, it's a very complex question. I don't have the answer, but what I can say, I was just in another meeting yesterday and we talked about the whole circular economy. It's a big challenge. The circular economy where you start to use no, new resources or recirculate some already used resources back into the food chain. It's a big, big challenge for the regulators and, and it's an issue for food safety also. Um, and at the moment, our thought is partly just automatic to say, no, this is, this is not okay to go into the food chain because it's new or it's partly new or it, is a, a, it used to be a side product or a, a residue. So the automatic reaction among the authorities, including the EU EFSA, is to say no. 
So this is a, this is a showstopper to the whole uh, circular economy and the green transition because we need to find new resources. We need to find the valuable products in our side streams. Otherwise, we, we cannot uh, really contribute to the green transition. And that is a challenge. And I, it may, I may be naive, but I think part of the solution is, again, in documentation, being able to document this instead of just saying no, if you can document that this product has been treated in this and this way, have not been in contact with meat products or whatever, then you can allow it. Um, there's a lot of cases coming up where this can be eaten uh, or not being eaten uh, when it's fermented. Like an example. Oh no, it, it's going to take too many minutes just to describe the examples, but there are several examples of small companies asking for permission to launch this as a food product and saying, no, but this is, what, when was it now? They said it was not consumed, consumed before 90, um, is it 94? I can't remember, 90. But, but then we stop everything. We stop the, for example, we cannot ferment crab meat. Why not? No, it was not on the market before 90. That's not a good argument. It's just an automatic reaction, not knowledge-based. So I don't, I, honestly, I don't have the solution or the answers for you, but I do believe we need to find better documentation practices. Yeah. Also, yeah, to, also to convince the authorities and to help the authorities because they actually want this future, but they don't know how to deal with it because our regulation is based on the future. No, on, on, on the past, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. And you pointed out quite well also the role of the human intervention in all these processes, especially in the uh, uh, blockchain adoption. And actually we discussed that before and it seems that is like the, the big uh, the big barrier that we have to, to have, we have to overcome to, to be more actually to, to spread the technology and spread new solutions uh, based on the technology. Yeah. Thank you so much. Nuri, is it okay? I'm I'm running out of time, and I really yes. need to sit down. I also we, think yeah, that yeah. the most important questions we covered here. Um, yeah, I think so. It's a pity that we don't have more time because it was really interesting. But I know Hawken will take the discussion uh, to a higher level, so I'm I'm very pleased to leave the floor to him. <laughs> okay, thank you okay. very much for your participation. It has been really interesting. Thanks for the invitation. It's been a seen. pleasure to be here. Uh, so have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. So now we go to Hakan Johnson, uh, Associate Professor at Lund University. Hi, Hakan. We can already see Hello, you. Hello, everyone. Here. Good to see you. Um, uh, what do you say? Do you need a short uh, break before we start the second session? Uh, or um, should I start right away? Um, I don't know. How do you feel, Lorenzo or Marta? Uh, Maybe we can do two minutes or three minutes, just that people grab something. It's up to you. If you want, uh, we can stop. Yeah, if you want, we can stop just to five minutes to grab a coffee, to, to go to the restroom, uh, to pee, <laughs> uh, and to come back uh, uh, quick. Yeah. Five minutes. That's, okay, let's do five minutes. Six minutes, six minutes. One more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so see okay. you back. See you in six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, should we get started? Yes. Perfect. Let me share my screen. So, this will be my topic for today. Uh, and I will sort of continue where Henning stopped with the questions on what uh, are the potential success criteria uh, among consumers in the blockchain technology? And also, of course, uh, how that can be learnings for the food industry. Uh, my name is Håkan Jansson. I'm an associate professor at the Departments of Arts and Cultural Sciences, as well as on the Department of Food Technology at Lund University, because I've been working with uh, cross-disciplinary uh, aspects of um, food and food studies. Uh, I'm also the chairman of this collaboration um, uh, dish um, global, um, global network for, for food safety in this year. 
What I'm going to do today is that I will start by taking you on a sort of an historical journey because the introduction of blockchain technology is definitely not the first or the last introduction of a disruptive uh, technology in the, into the food system. And I think as always, it could be interesting to learn and think a little bit about what are the consequences, uh, challenges, pitfalls, etc., uh, from previous uh, introductions of novel technologies into the food system. Uh, so my starting points are basically like this, that, I mean, we all know, and you definitely know after, after these days, if not before, that blockchain technologies may re revolutionize the food system and to some extent already has. But that depends quite a lot uh, on the perceptions and actions from the consumers. Um, uh, so uh, what, uh, when they interact with the new technology, uh, or even if they get the possibilities to interact, that's a rather specific issue of the blockchain technology is that it's to a large extent invisible uh, for the consumers, which of course leads to questions about the transparency and trust from the consumers. And I will get back to that um, by the end of the lecture. Um, uh, so uh, I want you to, as I said, it takes you to a little bit of a journey to learn from a historical comparative approach and also to introduce you to that it always been and probably always will be like that, that attitudes to food they differ between social groups and also between different situated practices. Where does the novel technology comes in? Does it come primarily come in in family meals or public meals or uh, in a national or regional food level uh, and so forth? And, uh, and also that the ideological standpoints of influential groups in society influence many consumers. So uh, it may be in, uh, interesting then to think about the who are influencing food consumers and in addition, of course, who are influencing the influences. Hmm? There is a very long tradition, I think, when we look at the future of food, at, le uh, at least uh, for the last 150 years, that the future has been associated with high-tech food uh, and especially with the idea of the meal in a pill. Um, however, even though that has been possible for many years, uh, and there are existing pills now for astronauts, uh, but we don't have them on a regular basis, right? Uh, so there are obviously some sort of constraints for implementing all novelties, all high-tech actions in the food system into our place, into our uh, everyday life. Uh, having said that, there is also big differences between how high-tech food uh, has been perceived by dominating consumer groups, uh, not least uh, during the last 50 years. Uh, but we can go even further back. Look at these quotes uh, from the late, uh, late 19th century. Depending on perspectives, I mean, the meal in the pill, the, the, new, um, the new technology could be conceived as a utopia or as a dystopia, depending on the perspective. The suffragette, uh, uh, leader of a women's rights movement, was seen the meal in appeal as the very positive moment. Uh, a small file of this life from the fertile bosom of Mother Earth will furnish men with substance for days, and thus the problems of cooks and cooking will be solved. So the meal in appeal for the suffragette woman was not so much a, a question about, um, about um, nutrients or meals in themselves. It was a question about power, about cooking, about women no longer have to be so chained to the stove cooking for the men. So from a consumer perspective, the meal in the pill was not food tech. It was a tool for women's liberation, right? Seeing that food tech may be 
seen from extremely different standpoints of view, depending on which are your perspective, which are your position in the food system. And there are so many food technologies that have been derived from uh, the food industry, from scientists and so on. And they have a completely different view and also a very internal view, rarely considering the meaning for the consumers. You also have a social conserv uh, conservation and that did a sort of a satirical account uh, with um, uh, trying to make fun of the idea that when the last pay, uh, the idea of uh, the, the abandonment of cooking whether, and say when the last pie was made the first pellet, women's true freedom began, um, summarizing this. And of course, um, it may be a part for freedom, but there was, of course, also a lot of a lot of things that would be lost in the process if we completely abandoned uh, abandoned cooking. So again, depending on the standpoints, not only that consumers and other parts of the food chain may have very different perspectives and uh, on the introduction of novel technologies, but there may also be conflicting views among consumers. So if we dig a little bit uh, um, into the fundamentals for introducing novel technologies, we can see that there are actually quite a lot of examples on how war were a boost for food tech introduction. Uh, I could start even back in the Napoleon Wars uh, because that's where the first time the preservatory can was introduced. Um, uh, and uh, the success of that, it, because it, it, it uh, really helped uh, the uh, the uh, French army to solve one of the main problems in all war times. Uh, one thing is to fight and to kill the other enemies. Another thing is then to move from one place to the other and make sure that you have food and water for the day. And the preservative can solve exactly that. So there are a lot of uh, innovations in the food system that comes uh, and are developed in a military context, uh, not least, uh, not least uh, in the logistic chains. There was also a big shift uh, when it came to um, the perception of food in World War II. I mean, the extent to one of the reasons for the, uh, the, the very, very high consumption of meat in the Western world uh, could actually be blamed to, um, to the US uh, army machine that were really lifting up the, uh, that the US army was the best fed army in the world. And they were fed with previously unthinkable amounts of meat, dairy, and to some extent also egg. And when they came back, they, they, uh, the soldiers that wanted to implement that in everyday life and the consumption of meat and dairy skyrocketed after the World War II. So that's, uh, that's just as putting into a, a context and, and, and to see how, um, how and when um, new novel technologies can be introduced in a successful way, uh, because that is often the problem, I mean, to normalize consumption, right? And what we could see in the decades following World War II, that there were a lot of uh, futurist food. In general, it was a very, very positive attitude towards um, high-tech food in the, in, in the 1950s. Um, you can see uh, the Jetsons, for instance, uh, the, the cartoon. They were also having meal in a pill. And that was considered as a sort of a, it was not a dystopia. It was kind of a cool way uh, of the future, uh, something you could laugh about a little bit, but uh, yeah, it kind of seemed okay. Um, on, on the right side of the screen, screen, you can see one of many examples of um, commercials from the time uh, about how uh, about how Tang, a strange uh, fizzy drink uh, with uh, I don't know if you any one of you have have, have tasted it, but it's sort of a, you, know, you know a powder that you put into water and then turn into some sort of some sort of soda um, with an ingredient list uh, which. Uh, nobody outside the chemical laboratories uh, understood, but it was cool and it was fine. So it was invented for the astronauts and for the Ryans. So how high tech food went from astronauts into the context of uh, domestic life, that was 
generally perceived as something positive. Here are uh, some Swedish examples. Uh, the rocket cheese to the left was launched shortly after the moon landing. A uh, rubbery texture um, melting cheese, uh, but it was packed with emulsifiers, so it, uh, it was easy to make a nice slices of, although it, it was, a, well, basically a, a, a melted cheese. You could, uh, you could even cut it into, uh, into pieces with a string attached to the packet. So if you just push the, your finger in the bottom and then you just slice your own pieces, so super convenient, no dishes uh, and so forth. Read an image of the future that was, uh, high tech, uh, very much uh, refined food and very convenient. Uh, and the taste was at the time also considered to, uh, to be nice. Also, an idea, it, it was a time where the idea of progress were dominant in society in general and maybe especially in the food sector. The commercial to, uh, commercial to the right, that is, um, uh, that is a commercial for the Swedish version of vinegar, vinegar the chemically distilled etika. And the, the woman on the picture is supposed to be uh, Eve, the first uh, woman on earth, uh, according to the Bible. And she is looking, uh, you know, just amazed on this bottle. And the message is that her dream is our reality, because women of all times have been longing for new ways to preserve, uh, uh, to preserve the fruits of the nature. And what if Mother Eve have had access to this new premium uh, vinegar that since 59 years ago produced a good and crystal clear preservatives where the valuable vitamins are preserved in a very efficient way. So this whole rhetoric about with the invention of new technologies in the food system, the food get better and that is something we can fulfill our dreams of longing um, uh, for many, many years. Um, this is also futurist food. It look, I just want to show it because they look absolutely disgusting. Um, some from uh, the, the the cookery books of, of, of the 1960s. Uh, packed in jelly is super convenient. You should prepare them in advance. And uh, to the left, you have a dessert, uh, orange jelly with bananas. Uh, bananas were very modern at the time in Northern Europe. And then uh, to the right, you have this fantastic aladab with, you know, you took a can of spaghetti rings in tomato sauce, and then you just uh, added a, a couple of uh, leaves of, of gelatin, and then into the, in, into the free, fridge, and then on top, cold white sausages as a garnish. And then that would be a very nice, um, you know, convenient way for a snack for the modern woman uh, that could prepare this in advance and still uh, still have uh, her husband's friends uh, over for dinner. You know, the whole uh, rhetoric, you know, of uh, modern way of cooking. Um, and it was considered as delicious at the time. Uh, we also had during, um, we, uh, during the 40s and 50s, a very, very similar discussion on the challenges of food system as it is today, not least with a need for a protein shift. And I think that can be um, interesting for you to know that a lot of the things that are invented now and you know sold on the market as inter alternatives to meat, they were actually you know, invented and launched on the market already in the 50s. Uh, algae burgers, um, there were a the whole concept of the chlorella cuisine, um, as, it were, as it was called. There were some um, there were some technical issues on scaling up the production, uh, difficulties to have a good price level and so on, but basically all the plant-based um, um, seaweed, uh, et cetera, alternatives uh, to meat and meat products, they were there. And they were, the, they were there on the market and sold in American supermarkets. Uh, but they kind of uh, they kind of kind of failed uh, for uh, for uh, different uh, reasons. Uh, one of which was because that the Green Revolution then actually solved many of the fears that 
people were very concerned with that uh, we would not have food enough to feed the growing population uh, as uh, because it was uh, you know the discussion in the 1950s was very much that it will be impossible uh, to feed the vast growing population of the world in 10 and 20 years then came the green revolution with much more efficient agriculture and the, the mass starvation of the next generation did not really come about and then some of these new products just fell out of the market um, but there was also another reasons for why all these products fail and that was that the future was redefined uh, starting in the counterculture of the late 1960s and early 1970s where there was a, all of a sudden a huge criticism to the food technology um, by the big industry. And the future for the hippie generation was not to, was, was to sort of jump off the high tech train to the future and return to the food tech of the past, such as the sour, sourdough loaves that you can see here. Uh, see here and i mean sourdough that's also definitely a novel food technology but then we have to go a couple of thousands years back in history uh, still so all of a sudden there was a shift here in the 1970s starting as a countercultural movement uh, with a sort of an anti-tech approach into the food system and that gradually, uh, gradually spread, and and uh, really early in the 1970s, uh, you could see products launched such as the Heinz tomato ketchup from 1970, an ad there which says that it's only tomatoes, no coloring, no preservatives, just great taste. And this is already in the 1970s, where the food industry all of a sudden. Uh, some parts of the food industry taking a step back, seeing that okay, perhaps we should not uh, we should not push forward the futuristic aspects of uh, novel food technology. We should just go for that. This is simple, pure food. No, no strange thing there. No strange additives and so. On. So from the post 1970s uh, until just a couple of years ago, you could say that the dominating idea was the less the merrier, the shortest ingredient list win. Um, even such a thing, I mean, if you read descriptions on a thing such as, you know, sort of basic food taste, whether to homogenize or not homogenize uh, the milk, you can see that in the descriptions that homogenized milk was described as the taste and texture were improved. End of story. Swedish uh, descriptions from 19. 78 or something. And then uh, just a couple of years later, unhomogenized uh, milk was reintroduced into the market. Uh, and all of a sudden, it was a truth uh, from a sensory perspective that unhomogenized milk tasted better. Why did it taste better? Because of the connection to the past, where all of a sudden, old fashioned milk, everything old fashioned, grandma, etc., were considered to be better than the artificial overprocessed food of the food industry. So we can see here that, to, um, that there are conflicting views. The idea of proper food, uh, the GM foods um, uh, launch in the 1990s further stressed this, uh, you know, Frankenstein food and so forth. So the food industry was all of a sudden uh, put into a very defensive position where uh, most of them, started to under communicate the level of technology and if new novel technology were launched they were often sort of disguised as you know old versions of of um, of uh, old technology uh, this was taken even further uh, on the new hipster generation which was sort of a slightly different base of consumers than the original hippie movement where it was uh, the, where the gastronomic argument for natural uh, old-fashioned ways of producing cheese etc uh, uh, became much more put to the forefront i mean if the if the counterculture generation they had uh, natural food uh, in spite of the taste uh, the hipster generation had it because of the taste there had been, of course, and there was a very 
big development in not least the organic food sector at the time, but it were interesting to see how the different arguments were there from a sort of a Puritan movement towards, um, you know, a simple life towards the hipster uh, that didn't want to compromise ideals of the good life, but still wanting to have the ideas of good old fashioned food. So still the same argument, cook from scratch, use fresh ingredients, avoid artificial food, but now with a sort of a gastronomic take. And all of this put the food industry in a position where novel technologies were quite undercommunicated. Uh, there, there, there were even these uh, these uh, uh, labels. We talked about la labels uh, earlier with Henning. So this is one of all the labels, which uh, where you can quantify in degrees of processing. Where, uh, as you can see, you will have uh, on the top is the unprocessed food, and on the bottom is the ultra processed food. And if you would have launched this scale in the 1950s, I'm sure that you could have the same scale, but but the quality of it would be reverse. You will have the ultra processed food as a property in the top of the hierarchy. But then, all of a sudden, just a couple of years ago, uh, it seemed like a, a new disruptive change. This is, uh, I used some example of Sweden just for you to, <laughs> to see it, get some exotic views of, from another market. This is one, one of the many similar uh, concepts of plant based uh, vegetarian alternatives to meet uh, the vegetarian hamburgers. Uh, which you can cook yourself. So this is just the minced meat, but it's not meat, it's, it's min, minced plants. And all of a sudden in the climate debate, there was a new generation that was, as any generation, wanted to uh, do something else than the older generation. So the hipster take uh, was sort of abandoned into a new way of thinking around food where for many in the new generation of consumers, they were considering much more other values than, uh, than say the gastronomic properties were thinking about sustainability the future of the planet. And all of a sudden that also seemed to mean that the fear uh, and the hesitation towards food technology and the processing of food was suddenly abandoned, at least if the food technology was interpreted as something good, that you could actually go on eating more or less the same thing, but you could eat in a more sustainable way. So this, uh, I mean, we can know, uh, we don't have to put any values in the description of all these uh, new uh, meat analogs, as they are called, uh, the transitions uh, or the replacements of meat, but they are indeed ultra processed, right? Uh, but all of a sudden that was not an issue anymore. So there is a new generation here, which think about novel food technologies in apparently slightly different ways than their parents or big brothers and sisters. So there is this new return of processed food, which I find quite interesting when it comes to the potential communication of all novel technologies, including blockchain technologies. There is a new generation raised by social media and climate that China did a sudden switches to actually to the food of their parents' childhood. I mean, the, the parents that may have grown up in, in the 1950s. Um, uh, and uh, the chlorella cuisine returns with a number of similar concepts, uh, which I will call to cultural negotiations of potential food source shortages uh, uh, and, of course, I mean, sustainability cha challenges in, um, in general. So coming as far, far as this, I mean, I think it's fair to say, uh, or, or say to complicate the pictures on whether consumers are food tech friendly or food tech negatives. Uh, it may of course differ between different uh, consumer groups, but there are dominating rationality of different epochs. Uh, and those can be explained by many different reasons. Um, one of the reasons is sort of, of course that each new generation want to be something different to their parents, but that does not explain the full picture. I think that the perceived main problems of the day is a very important factor here. So when it comes to food security, gender equality, stress of everyday life, health, 
uh, and to some extent, depending on the context, also sustainability. Consumers generally embrace food tech. Uh, but then there is our, our actually and the uh, food safety, taste, lifestyle cooking, and also health, but from a slightly different take, consumers react against food tech. And the interesting thing here, not least when we come to food safety and taste, that the intention of the processing from the food company has very often been to ensure food safety and a good taste, but it has been interpreted the, 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 the opposite way. So this sort of mismatch still seems to be there uh, uh, and needs to be taken account when you uh, discuss and try to promote different food products to the market, to the consumers. And sometimes I've met uh, industry representatives and also not least uh, food scientists uh, from uh, working with them, um, working with um, food production, uh, shaking their heads and you as a consumer expert, uh, supposedly Håkan, can you explain this? Why are consumers so rational? Uh, so irrational. Uh, and I say, but you think about it in the wrong way because then you reduce rationality to be that if, if you could reduce food to simply nutrition or simply price um, or, or simply some, some other thing, the, the problem of eating, and it is a huge problem to eat, right? Uh, it's, also, it's also something fantastic and joyful, uh, joyful movements. But the problem of eating is that it does so many things at the same time. Um, so we need to take into account that when consumers prepare a meal, we do not, you know, we cannot think about just one thing, not even about sustainability, because it's a constant navigation between the bodily needs and the social needs and wants. So I think that most, when you see the successful, unsuccessfulness of novel food products and novel food technologies, you can, you can very often explain it through whether it did enhance the community of the meal, the social relations, uh, and or the identity making, that you could position yourself as an individual within a certain group and in society. We have the time management issue. We organize time and we must manage time by food and cooking. We have the gender relations issue. I mean, the, the idea whether it's uh, whether it makes the gender relations better, simpler, etc and so many more aspects when it comes in. And this is where all the novel, uh, novel technologies must fit in. And that's where they make sense from consumers. So innovations have always had social effects and often influenced by social change. I mean, we could take the invention of the milk carton that in, uh, for instance, that uh, made it possible to sell milk in ordinary supermarkets that was de developed most at the same time as the new milk product, which led to a complete brand new way of shopping, more, much more time efficient, but not really good for the runners of the milk stores. Yeah, the frozen foods that developed a whole new way of, you know, reducing the number of times a week where you had to go, go shopping. Um, same thing, of course, with the refrigerator, uh, and uh, to the left is the original separator uh, from from milk, which which made it possible to have an industrial production of butter. All of these is they have had social effects, and some influence they are they are, they are very much influenced by the social change. Before I wrap up with a discussion uh, and introduction to a discussion about how this can be used in relation to to um, uh, blockchain and the food chain. Uh, I want to show you this. I mean, consider Starbucks. It was one of the main success of the, around the turn of the millennium. The way of drinking coffee was changed forever in the global North. But what was special with it? I mean, was it the coffee? Not really, right? I mean, it was uh, it was more or less the same coffee that uh, that you have you have served. Was it the concept? Mm -hmm. Maybe to some extent, uh, the packaging. Well, paper mugs 
were not a new invention, right? They had been existing for years, but it was the context of where the packaging put in. So I would say that it was this. I mean, the invention was that you had a concept with a coffee to go, not least, where you had a concept designed to encourage new ways of mobility in urban settings. And Starbucks found the key to realize that people have started to move around in urban settings in brand new ways. And that it all of a sudden has become acceptable to consume food and drinks without sitting down on a table. So it was in many cases much more a social innovation than a food product um, or, or a food or, or a food service innovation, if you ask me. Feel free to disagree. Anyway. Uh, how does this then, uh, how is this then related to the blockchain technology? Well, I think that Henning pointed to some uh, very good points uh, by the end of the of the last session that we may continue to discuss here. Uh, there are definitely some some challenges and, and opportunities when it comes to blockchain technologies and food, and there are some definitely some potential consumer values. Uh, there are potential values of transparency, trust, and quality. And we know that the issues of transparency and trust, uh, and of course, always quality, are one of the main problems in the relations in the food system. That most consumers feel that there is a lack of transparency and a lack of trust against many actors in, in, into the food system. Uh, and then I think it's important to think if you want to use uh, use this into the food system, at least to the extent that it that it could and should be communicated to consumers, must focus on the effects on the technology in human life and not only on the convenience, safety, and nutritional aspects. I mean, saying that yes, blockchain technology that's good for our profit, no value in the consumer market, right? So. Take instead a focus on the eating as a process that creates meaning and try, try to define the kinds of meaning which can be enhanced through novel technologies. What about, if, uh, what about the user? It, would it be easier to live in a community and express our identity uh, or help the user to live in a sustainable way? Provide those arguments if, uh, if there are any, and that of course depends on the context where it's in, introduced. And narrow down when, where, and how people experience eating of the concepts or products as meaningful or as a problem, and then think of potential applications. So try to reverse uh, the perspectives into the system. And then, of course, there are a lot of potential uh, and also ongoing negative consumer perceptions of blockchain technologies, not least um, the, the fear of surveillance. I mean, one thing is that you can, uh, and that also goes when to introduce it. I mean, you could introduce blockchain technology to uh, already today to follow individual consumers and to see what they eat. And that is, of course, of huge value to insurance companies that you, you know, target the right consumers that will eat uh, more, more sustainable. But if, <laughs> if you provide those kinds of data that can be used in this way to, se to select consumers into different categories, you will have a very, very difficult uh, discussion with consumer groups about Big Brother watching you and trying to make uh, profit and benefit uh, on, uh, uh, on, the, on the, the weak groups in society. Uh, we have the corporate profits, the, the global uh, food chains. That's also another concept. Okay, so if you have a disruptive technology that makes it so much easier and better, you know, to follow a, a, a food in, in, in different contexts, that can, as also Henry pointed out, that can be very good uh, for, for instance, ensuring that organic food is organic. Uh, but it can also be a tremendous uh, opportunity for global food chains to become even more effective and kill local economies that may perhaps not uh, be able to invest into the blockchain technologies. And that actually concludes my uh, presentation. So now I am uh, happy to 
uh, have a little bit of a discussion with you uh, about uh, whether you find these ways to think about uh, novel technologies uh, in general and uh, and uh, blockchain technologies uh, in particular useful and if you can see any potential applications in your work. Thank you. Many thanks, Hakan. So any questions or comments from the, from the audience? It seems they all agree with what you said. <laughs> Okay, um, well, thanks. Um, thanks a lot, Anne. and I mean, I, I will be available if anything uh, pops up, uh, if, if there are questions later on. Okay. Thank you very much for, for inviting you. me. Thank you very much. Very interesting. So right now we are going to the break. So we have a half an hour break and we will be coming back uh, with uh, Terence Law and he will be speaking about the impact of COVID-19 in, 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 in on the food safety and challenges and opportunities. So see you back at, uh, uh, let's see, uh, 11, quarter past 11, Portuguese time. Thank you. I can't hear. Hi, Terence. Hi. So yes, so we are on time back from the break. OK. And, uh, yeah. And now um, we will start with the last two lectures of the Trusted Summer School. And the first one, as I announced before, it will be with Professor Terence Law from the Food Safety Consortium from PolyU in Hong Kong. And he will then be speaking about the impact of COVID in, in the food safety. So Professor Terence, when you want, Thank you, Maria. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us to share with you some of the uh, update about COVID and food safety. And uh, we're very glad to be at the INL Summer School and actually hope all of you have a very good summer. The school started uh, yesterday, the day before actually. And, but I think uh, we all have a very good uh, uh, summertime and uh, even those that uh, we have been restricted on traveling, but uh, I hope that the situation will be getting better. So um, let me share my screen. Uh, this one. Okay. Um, the topics that I would like to share today is the, about the food safety at, uh, under the COVID pandemic. And I would like to give an overview. Uh, you can see the screen, right? You all can see the screen. And yes. uh, I, I will give an overview on uh, food safety uh, in related to the COVID uh, uh, viruses, uh, the sars cov virus 2 uh, And then I will pass to my colleagues, uh, Bernard, Dr. Bernard Chang, who is uh, a project manager at the Food Safety Consortium. He will talk a little bit more about the situation under COVID pandemic, in particular in the food uh, system, supply chain system, and also the possibility to have new technology helping out uh, the, the situation. So uh, a little bit refresh on the memory, uh, even though it's not long ago, but it's already been a one and a half years since we have started with this uh, scary virus, you know, uh, back in 2019, December, we have the first case in mainland China and uh, uh, with the with, uh, with patient with pneumonia. And then uh, very rapidly, we figured out the virus, uh, the, the, the cause, causative agents of the pneumonia is from the coronavirus, uh, which is very, very similar to, it have, to the one where uh, you know, with that we have uh, back in year 2003 in Hong Kong. So we name it sars coronavirus 2 And uh, then, uh, you know, people start change to respond to it. And in particular, Hong Kong and mainland China, because we had experienced SARS back in year 2003. So 
we rapidly, you know, uh, ramp up a lot of actions. You know, a lot of people start wearing face masks and also even face shields and you know, to try to stop the transmission of virus from uh, people, you know, uh, from one person to another. So we uh, make a lot of measure uh, to stop the human to human transmission. And, uh, but we also experienced a lot of difficulties because by that time was uh, Chinese New Year's, most of factories closed down. So we were, uh, you know, uh, 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 we had a lot of problems on getting face masks, you know, getting uh, the, the price of a face mask going up very, very uh, sharply. But uh, ending up that we are quite good in containing the situation. Right now in Hong Kong, uh, we, do not have much cases, maybe one or two cases per day. Uh, most of them are, are, are traceable and uh, we do not record any local cases, but, but still the virus keep evolving. So um, uh, since we had the virus started uh, 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 at, uh, at the end of year 2009, we have experiencing different strains of virus and uh, with the Delta virus, which has a higher infectivity and also the, the you know, uh, and, and also maybe uh, the mortality really hit the world very, very fiercely. And up to this moment, uh, I think there are more than 200 million people infected and uh, approximately uh, 4.5 million people died of COVID. It's really a, 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 a you know, tragedy of, of the century. So uh, you look at the, uh, the, the timeline and uh, of course, you know, we, we are a bit okay, right? uh, you know, uh, lucky that the vaccine is coming out, um, but we're still facing a lot of, you know, situation, uh, new situation because the virus is still mutating. Well, the Delta variant is still scattering all over the world uh, uh, when, when, you know, when they come into the human population. Well, actually, um, we are not, you know, surprised, you know, uh, you know, as a, as a microbiologist, you know, the epidemics, you know, happens all the time. Uh, and uh, we all remember the first, you know, very, you know, uh, we record uh, uh, the, the pandemic, you know, back in year 2018, the Spanish flu, which killed more than 30 million people in the world. And then after that, we also have recorded the number of epidemics like you know, Asian flu also killing a million people, Hong Kong flu because it was started uh, and scattering in Hong Kong by that time. And then we have SARS uh, in year 2003. And we also has been hit continuously by avian flu, you know, H1, H2, H3, H5, H7. So honestly speaking, for a microbiologist, uh, we this is something uh, that we can expect, but just don't know when it's coming to the places. Maybe 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years, or 100 years, but it will come because the virus keep evolving. If the virus evolves to a, to, a, to a stage that the, the infertility getting to a, you know, uh, uh, to a more mild, a minor uh, uh, situation, the epidemic may stop. But if the infectivity, in, infectivity mutate to, 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 to be very high, the, the, the situation will become worse. So uh, if you remember SARS back in 2003, uh, uh, the in, uh, the, it happens back in April, early April, and then stop in the summertime. Uh, just, you know, uh, most of the studies show that the, the infectivity, you know, going down according to time. So it will not mutate, it, it did not mutate in the strongest strain. So we, we, we have this uh, virus gone, but this time seems, you know, uh, very different. The virus keep, you know, mutating and become a little bit, you know, uh, stronger and stronger. So we're still under a big hit. And of course, you know, we hope that it will not be getting worse, but no one know what will be the situation. So the only thing that we, 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 we can hope for is to have a better vaccine or, and also uh, to have a better therapeutic. So, uh, but it's going to be a situation that we have to live with the virus for, for the you know, rest of the days because same as it become a, a local epidemic, I mean, uh, epidemic in most of the countries and it 
may not be easy to get away. So, uh, but war still continues. Uh, so we, we just you know, hope for a better future by doing a lot more contain, containments and uh, a lot more appropriate measure and do more science to come up with a better uh, weapons to fight against the sars cov virus uh, too. But going back to the, the, the food safety matters, you know, when the sars cov virus start scattering over the world, a lot of people also concerning about the food safety, whether food can carry the virus, whether food can, you know, uh, be a, one of the mediums to, uh, uh, to uh, you know, transport the virus to human. Um, by that time, a lot of uh, uh, reports, you know, no matter from WHO, FAO, CDC, uh, have uh, provided confidence that food by itself is not the medium for transporting the viruses. And actually, virus require hosts, and uh, and and we we need live animals or live hosts to to carry virus to 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 a people. And if we eat food most of the time. We eat you know cooked food, and high temperature can kill the virus. So food normally would not be a uh, you know medium to transport the virus. It may not be easy for us to to get the virus uh, through contacting or eating uh, food. Uh, you know, uh, items. But uh, it's obvious virus can survive on surfaces. You know, that's the reason we continuously, um, well, not just survive on surfaces, but survive in the environment. That's the reason we continue, well, continuously being hit by many different viruses, including flu viruses, because virus has a property that they can become dormant, especially under cold temperature. So um, it is very possible, you know, by looking at the basic scientific principle, we may be able to contact uh, the virus, you know, when it appears on the surface of food items. So that's the reason um, we keep on, you know, after that, you know, even though that we have been assured or we have been uh, 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 informed, food would not be the possible medium to transport or to, to, to do the transmission of the viruses, but we also cannot eliminate the possibility that the virus can be on food package surface or on food surface, and that we may be able to get in touch with. So, um, and, and since then, uh, uh, well, even though a lot of agency uh, uh, try to uh, eliminate concern of most of the, you know, of, of the general public that food would not be a medium to uh, uh, trans, uh, transmit the virus, but a lot more reports showing that we found live viruses from food packaging. These are the, some of the news uh, in mainland China, also in Hong Kong. We were able, we were able to identify or culture the live virus uh, from frozen food package. It, it has been contaminated and it's not uncommon. For example, when people getting more and more uh, uh, you know, uh, and more people getting infected. Um, some of them may work in food factory, and if they do not have uh, very good personal hygiene, or they do not wear uh, appropriate personal protection equipment like face masks or face shield or gloves, if the person can, you know, get infected, uh, when they caught, you know, they may spread the virus onto the package. And these viruses under cold temperature can be transmitted you know, uh, through the uh, cold chain over the places. So it's, it's a, a, a very basic scientific, uh, 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 you know, uh, expectation that food, you know, not itself, but the food item may carry virus, even though the, the percentage is no, but uh, it is also one of the concern that we may need to uh, pay uh, on. And, uh, and because the, 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 the situation getting, uh, you know, uh, longer and longer, so we uh, have also identified a lot more evidence that uh, uh, food item uh, under cold condition can carry the virus. And these viruses are, uh, are found alive. And, uh, and recently, last month, just last month, we also found some viruses on fish and maybe the handler uh, got infected, so they contaminated the fish. And, uh, and, and, and lucky that we do not have cases, uh, you know, people infected 
because of the contaminated fish, but it's, it's possible if, you know, really, you know, if, if the people touch on the fish and then without washing their hands and, you know, uh, touch their mouth uh, or nose, the virus may be able to get into the human body. So um, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a concern, uh, the hygiene in the, all, you know, uh, 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 steps of fruit pulp production, you know, from factory, from the manufacturing uh, uh, points uh, to the supply chain to even to the catering places. So, so um, uh, 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 hygiene uh, measurement uh, is one of the very critical uh, matters that we have to uh, deal with, you know, in order to uh, uh, minimize the uh, infections, you know, from the uh, package, uh, I mean, uh, from the COVID virus. And you also see a lot of news in now China recently, uh, based on the WHO report, you know, uh, early this year, and and I try to identify the source of the virus and uh, seems cold chain in is one of the suspects because uh, 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 we we still do not have any idea where and you know uh, from which origin the virus has ri uh, arised, but uh, we keep on identifying uh, identifying evidence that. Uh, frozen package may contain the uh, uh, virus, the live virus. So uh, we don't know uh, what 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 it would be. I mean, the final re re reason uh, of of the origin of the uh, of pandemic. But uh, I think um, for food items, you no, know, uh, food itself would not be a uh, agent uh, uh, that can change this virus you know, in most of the situation, but food packaging under cold temperature could be an issue, especially uh, we, we, uh, we, when, when, when you know, more and more people get infected, you know, they work in factory, they work in all places with, related to food supply, the, uh, the infected person may contaminate uh, food items that cause you know, transmission of the virus from one place to another. And, and, and of course, you know, high temperature can kill the virus. You know, uh, there are a lot of reports showing that the virus may not be able to survive when temperature over 60 and even, you know, at 40 degree, the, the, the half-life of virus, uh, you know, decrease very uh, uh, rapidly. So um, temperature can kill the virus, but when, when we talk about shipping of food item at cold chain, the virus may persist, you know, in, in the cold chain and can be carried from one place to another. So this is the uh, food uh, safety in the, in the, you know, I mean, uh, 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 in, directly, uh, in direct relationship with the uh, uh, pandemic. And you can see these studies, you know, there are many studies from time to time showing the, the survival rate of the virus on different uh, uh, surfaces uh, under different conditions. So this will give us a lot more information how we should tackle the food safety during the whole manufacturing chain from, from, you know, from farms to fork, there are many stages that involve food handling and, uh, and also involve uh, human. And once human get infected, you know, uh, you will still have possibility to, in, you know, to contaminate the food items, you know, you, uh, no matter whether the package or the food item itself. So uh, we, we have to pay attention on this. And uh, many, many advices, you know, giving out, you know, from time to time from different authority uh, telling us what we should be concerned and they keep updating. So the advices from the very beginning talking about uh, the, you know, the, the food and the, you know, uh, uh, SARS, uh, uh, the COVID pandemic may not be applied on today's situation. So um, my advice is um, we keep, we have to keep updated on the situation, and and even you know you 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 know the virus keep mutating, and the new strain may also have different uh, concern. You know, so we need to keep track on the news uh, uh, developments of the uh, 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 of the virus or the pandemics. And actually, uh, two days ago, we also identified a new mutant in South Africa which is higher in infectivity. We still do not know the mortality of the virus, but the, you know, high infectivity means that it can affect human more effectively. 
and can be stay, you know, and may be able to stay longer. So if the person being infected with this new variant uh, and, uh, and if they work in in any process, uh, you know, any food process uh, processing, uh, it may also cause food safety matter. So this is uh, one of the uh, concern uh, we have to be aware of. You know, if we talk about COVID and food safety, but again, you know, um, COVID, uh, I mean, the sars cov uh, team may not be able to be carried food, food I mean, the, the uh, food by itself. So that's not directly related to food safety, but the effect on COVID on the food system may be huge uh, because it distracts the whole supply chain and exacerbate the food insecurity. For example, uh, for food safety, we have to run a lot of system to maintain it. And for example, uh, uh, auditing is one of the very common tools that most of the company use to audit the, whether the food uh, is safe or in good shape. But you know, right now we do not, we cannot travel and, uh, and we cannot do a lot of on-site inspections and we cannot carry a lot of on-site testing and we may not be able to make advices on, uh, on, on, on the food system by looking at the real time uh, uh, situation. Uh, even for a lot of temperature checking, we may not be able to do uh, because in the most of the time, uh, in the past, most, most of the you know, checking are based on human inspection, eye inspection. So uh, uh, COVID causing a lot of restrictions you know, on the daily life and that in return or uh, in turn cause a lot of you know, problems on food safety. But at the same time, uh, uh, even though we, uh, we, we are encountering so many difficulties, we can think of you know, a lot of technology, a lot of new system. Uh, we're very used to our, uh, our, our, you know, our norm. You know, uh, a lot of people, they may not be think of anything new as long as they are using the system in uh, you know uh, uh, for long and also uh, uh, in good shape. But now we are facing new situation. That may be a time for us to find a new way. So that I would say it would be a opportunity for us to see how we can further improve our food safety system, in particular in the in the area of food supply chains and cold chain management and food security. And uh, I'm making use of new technology like blockchain technology big data, AI, and remote uh, uh, you know, um, collection of information using IoT to you know, help you know, advancing the food system. I think this is uh, one of the opportunities I think we may be able to uh, uh, you know, observe and uh, to uh, implement in order to advance our, our current system. It would be very useful even you know, after the COVID pandemic. We hope the COVID pandemic will, will pass uh, very soon, but uh, I think it would be a very good opportunity. We need to think of something new in order to uh, sustain our you know, food supply chain and food safety management system. And one thing before I pass to my colleagues, you know, I have to uh, uh, you know, uh, advise, you know, we are at the same time also facing a lot of you know, psychological issue. I, uh, after the long time, a uh, uh, restriction due to the COVID pandemic. You know, we call the pandemic fatigue, and it's well recognized. A lot of people start uh, 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 not, you know, doing their personal protection uh, uh, appropriately, and uh, do the gathering, you know, without the mask on, uh, uh, with reluctance to take vaccination, and and reluctant to follow the 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 you know. Re, um, uh, 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 restrictions. I mean, the restriction try to minimize the spread of the virus. I think these social factors. I mean, so, so uh, social response due to pandemic factors may be one of the issues that we uh, need to deal with. You know, especially uh, when we see all the people eating in a restaurant, we have to mask off. You know, we cannot have a mask and and at the same time eating and drinking. So um, and uh, we also miss more, many of our friends. We try to gather, uh, you know, uh, 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 together, and also try to have a, a you know not a big party, but at least a party, 
uh, you know, with more people. So, um, uh, but, you know, there are still a risk. Uh, so I think um, all these uh, pandemic measure, we have still to, uh, you know, watch out until we have a very reliable vaccine and also the therapeutics, you know, uh, otherwise it will, you know, the, the, the you know, pandemic may come back, you know, I mean, well, we're still under a pandemic, but local epidemic may, 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 may come, you know, out from, uh, you know, from time to time and uh, the situation will become endless. So uh, this is one of the issue, I think, uh, it's also uh, that we have to deal with. We also had a big hit on, on catering industry and, uh, uh, and how to, uh, maintain the environment clean enough to avoid any uh, uh, infections happening or, or uh, uh, happening in, in the restaurants, also one of the issues. So um, I mentioned a little bit about the security supply chain system. I will allow my colleagues, uh, Dr. Bernard Chen, to go into a little bit more detail in what areas you know, uh, that we can do to enhance the food safety under the COVID pandemic. So for now, please. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> uh, this is Bernard Chan. I'm gonna talk a little bit about, besides the food safety issue, how the, <clears throat> The COVID-19 uh, virus uh, has affected the uh, food system in different areas. Um, food security is one area that's very much affected by the COVID-19 virus. Um, this slide shows the uh, mass, uh, a survey by, uh, uh, commissioned by the Mars Global Food Safety uh, Center. They uh, survey 1,750 people in the US, UK and China um, to see how they, if they have any awareness or concerns about food safety and security. And um, the results shows that the over half, 52% said food safety and security, one of the three most important issues facing the world today. So unsurprising the um, food security concerns, um, it's escalated by the um, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, if seventy-three percent, about three out of four respondents believe that the pandemic uh, will impact the viability of the global food supply chain, and then seventy-one percent believe that it will have an impact on global access to food. So, in fact, the uh, worries expressed uh, in the survey actually bears out. Unfortunately, and sadly, um, as we actually see a um, increase of food price on a global scale, the UNFAO, the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, food price index uh, globally, as you can see on the right hand side of the chart, um, <clears throat> actually rose 5% between April and May of this year, 2021. This is just in one month. And <clears throat> from year to year, year on year, uh, from past August to this August, it rose by 40%. Um, several factors basically slow down in uh, transports, most commonly, most commonly in the cross-border freight, freights, increase in the freight costs, and along with the decrease in income. Many people are unemployed or underemployed uh, many, across many industries during the pandemic. So, so the income decrease and the spending power also decrease. They all add up to uh, deepening the global hunger. So in other words, um, the COVID-19 pandemic increased global food insecurity in almost every country uh, by reducing income and disrupt disrupting the food supply chain. If the poor will suffer the uh, greatest of all the food crisis, um, this map here, shows area where higher structural vulnerability correspond to a larger manager of food insecurity. Now on this map, the, um, the structural vulnerability includes, uh, shows that it includes natural calamities such as flood, drought, cyclones, or locust infestation, and, in, and also man-made disaster such as conflicts, 
unrest, displacement, or other political instability. Um, such a vulnerability coupled with shocks such as COVID-19 lead to the hunger, hunger uh, hotspot as shown in this, uh, uh, shown this map as um, predicted by the FAO uh, currently in this quarter. In the last uh, two consecutive years, 2020 and uh, this year, 2021, um, there are reports uh, put out by five UN, eight, five, five agencies from the UN, the reports on food security and nutrition. COVID-19 has increased the number of undernourished population by um, tens of millions. Uh, one estimate is over 132 million people uh, have been added to the rank of undernourished just in the year 2020. And an additional 30 million more people may face hunger in the year 2030, um, more than if the pandemic had not occurred. And an additional five to seven million children may be stunned because of the pandemic. So we will look at um, three cases, um, many cases actually, um, about how a technology um, such as blockchain and IOTs um, can work to help absorb some of the shocks in the food system, um, provide more reliability and authenticity, and be more efficient in reducing food, uh, food waste. I'd like to thank uh, one of our partners in uh, several of our projects, uh, Oracle Systems. Um, I know that INL are partnered with IBM, but uh, Oracle has been very good and be very helpful um, to provide these three cases, which are real world cases that have uh, adopted um, their technologies in um, making things better in the food system. The first mini case is bee mark. So as you all know, the honeybees have um, seen the number de decline by quite a bit uh, since the late um, early 2000, late 1900s. Um, there's a 25 decrease in, in hives in, in Europe and 40% decrease in the US since 2008. Um, honeybee being the primary pollinators in the agricultural system, there's a risk, risk for food production. Um, I think in the US, about one third of the food eaten by Americans uh, comes from crop pollinated by honeybees. So the World Bee Project has applied blockchain technology to the honey supply chain. And they have a bee mark uh, shown um, here is developed to guarantee that the honey product is from ecological and sustainable uh, sources. Each party involved in the honey supply chain will be able to upload information uh, to a blockchain to a distributed ledger technology. And as, the, as we all know, the data is uh, immutable. So the honey can be traced back from the hive to the, to the store. Now the blockchain is only as good as the um, information you, you put into it. Um, in this case, um, they are trying to put together um, sensors at different parts of the, um, the honey production system, including near the hive in the soil, uh, measuring environmental factors, temperatures, um, and whether there are pesticides and so on. Uh, this is not the same um, project that Oracle has worked previously uh, using a blockchain to identify fake honey. This is more inclusive one that includes different environmental factors and all being uploaded into a blockchain. Hopefully the productions of uh, honey and indeed other food items, if they adopt the technology will be more robust and be, uh, uh, we can absorb shocks better, including different viruses and other, other, other shocks from the economy. Second case look at is a um, agency called Certify Origins. Certified Origin uh, from Italy was born from a desire to produce and export high quality extra virgin olive oil. Most of the export is from Italy to the US. So as uh, Terence mentioned earlier, it's rather hard to uh, do a lot of uh, auditing. Um, so a lot of trust and, um, has to be automated. And then in, in fact, uh, with blockchain, um, this can be accomplished.
So most of the um, the previous speakers um, also mentioned transparency. Um, depending on the culture, the U.S. Uh, requests transparency. So um, by trying to export to the U.S. Um, uh, Italian uh, oil uh, olive oil company, uh, in this case a Bellucci, working with uh, certified origin, they're able to do that by using a blocking technology. In addition to transparency, there's also um, other incentives such as re reducing operation costs and the certification process can be uh, can be less paper based and less auditing from shipments that are made from uh, Italy to the U.S. And the third mini case is a um, a brewery in the California um, Bay Area. Alpha Asset Brewery, they have a network of um, raw ingredient suppliers um, shown on the, the figure on the left, uh, from, from malts to the body to the yeast. And they also have downstream uh, consumers uh, or buyers of their products, um, beer place, pubs, uh, consumers, and um, uh, other, other, other catering. With the help from IoT sensors and other inputs, um, anyone can access all the information about the ingredients, and including the production process, the temperature, control and testing, the packaging and the distributions of the products. Um, in, including the mod and other supplier, they can also um, have a parameters using IoT being uploaded to a blockchain, such as when the the different crops been harvested, what is the field condition, the temperature, or even the amount of nitrogen in the soil. And you can see on the right hand side, anybody can using a very simple app to look at the different processes and then the dis distribution mode. So end to end traceability of food supply network powered by blockchains that enables uh, full transparency across the food chain to minimize, to maximize shelf life, guarantee freshness, and in, in fact, increase the recall response efficiency. Now, these three cases are for real companies. They are not very big conglomerates, uh, and only they, they, but they can serve as proof of concepts that um, and in real world situations, watching can make a difference from, from the SMEs um, and hopefully for other, other, other big companies as well. So um, just to wrap things up here. Uh, okay. okay. So just uh, some, some, uh, something about Body U, what we've been doing, as Terence mentioned, uh, in response to the pandemic. Um, so uh, Terence Lab actually has uh, developed a, a multiplex diagnostic system that can take up to uh, 40 um, pathogens. Uh, in a single run. It takes about 40 minutes for the run. <laughs> about 40 minutes for the run. Um, that's being currently looked at and being commercialized. And then the um, engineering department has uh, made 3D printed uh, face shield for medical staff, the first row out, but now it's for uh, more people in the public. And then also with the Macau University of Science and Technology has uh, jointly developed a new AI system to assist in the rapid diagnosis of uh, COVID-19 related pneumonia. And the results been published in the, in the journal cell. Also with uh, uh, the, uh, the Macau University of Science and Technology and Chinese institutions um, have developed a recombinant LVD vaccine against the uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and that paper has been published in Nature. And skip this, okay. And then uh, real world de deployment of the uh, of the innovations that uh, in in uh, retail settings and in catering situations uh, of the face shield. Uh, anything? Okay. And I will wrap up here, I think, because I'm running low on time. And we'll gladly take any questions you may have. Thank you. How do I? Thank you very much for the presentation. So any questions from the audience, Marta? Yes, um, 
Hello, thank you very much for the for the presentations. It was really very interesting, and it was uh, yeah very very nice to see all of this information all together in one in one presentation. I have a couple of questions um, uh, related mainly with well my field of expertise that is food safety and and quality. Um, it was uh, it's more related with the presentation with from Professor Lowe um, and the, the study about the detection of uh, um, SARS-CoV-2 in, in, in frozen food. Um, I, I was wondering um, if this could be, uh, I mean, if you are also checking um, variants in, in this uh, frozen food packages and, and and frozen food and since this i mean is is thing that is not actually um being transmitted by food if this could be a, a way of of um of checking the evolution of the variants uh, in different geographical locations for example as as is being done with the wastewater what do you think this could be used for this? Are you are you also checking variants, or that could be something for the future? Here. Um, hi, um, because we have several people in the room, so we have to wear masks. <laughs> Personal <laughs> hygiene that we have to be to follow. Sure. Uh, yeah, of course. You know, uh, I think um, it would be. Uh, of course, we know more. We we can do better. That's the basic principle. So um, I think a lot of study uh, has been done in the past, but by that time, we do not have any information about the variants, but now getting to the stage that a lot of new variants uh, with higher infectivity and mortality coming out. So I think it would be good if we can also check, you know, and uh, whether there is the, you know, the variance on the on the package. This you know exists in the food package. So I um, I would agree to do more on that because the pandemic is still undergoing. Uh, it's not the end. Uh, you know we we may have a lot more to do in the future as well. So I I think it would be useful. And I agree with your suggestion on checking yeah. variance. Yep. Hope I can oh, answer. Your yeah. So oh, indeed very interesting, yeah. Um, then another another question. Uh, there has been reports also related with the second part of the presentation, with with the second part of your presentation, Professor Lo, um, that um, related with food safety, food security, and um, and how COVID nineteen has affected no the whole food value chain. There has been reports indicating that due to um maybe some some problems of supply in some food value chains there has been an increase on on food flow um uh, at least in, in in europe do you do you guys have the same impression or the same um yeah kind of uh yeah feedback from not, analysis yeah. I do not have any, uh, you know, exact figures or, or data about the food flow under pandemic. But, uh, you know, uh, no matter there is any pandemic or not, of uh, uh, crimes happens all the time. <laughs> they will find ways to get their advantages uh, uh, from the system. So there is no doubt if somebody, you know, making, you know, the, the, you know, doing some sort of, you know, illegal things on food supply chain. So, so that is something that we also need to be aware of, you know, under pandemic, a lot of, you know, uh, real, uh, real time on site auditing may not be able to in place. So um, there are a lot of chances for some people to, 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 to fraud the system. So uh, we, this is something that we also need to be, uh, be careful and uh, we all believe you know because the, the current restriction we cannot really do the you know a lot of things you know as usual so technology may be one of the you know way that can help you know to eliminate certain situation i'm not saying that technology would be the perfect solution for all scenarios but it would be something that can help you know to to tackle some of the situation that we may not be able to, what we did not encounter, we would not be able to encounter before. 
So uh, yeah, I, I, I would expect uh, I, a lot of we a situation happening <laughs> under the pandemic situation. So no, no surprise if any frauds and happenings, you no, know, uh, that, that, that some of the people making use of the current situation to, to do some sort of illegal things. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I just to, to finalize the, my, my questions or comments, I like it a lot when you mentioned that, I mean, this situation could be a good opportunity to rethink our, our you know, uh, our systems of, of control and rethink the, 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 the food value chains. And I, I, I fully agree. I think that was a, a nice, a nice, um, yeah, uh, uh, feedback from from all of this you know out of the you know this situation we can also take some some good things for the for the future and i think that's very positive thank you very so much when there, are, when, when, you know, when there is a risk there is opportunity that's yeah. the... <laughs> okay thank you okay thank you very much terence and your colleague also for the presentation and your time in the in the uh, trusted summer school. So now we don't have time for more questions and we need to move to the last session. So this time we are with Tulia Galina Toski uh, from the University of Bologna. Welcome. Thank you for participating. Uh, so feel free to start whenever you want. Okay. I try to share my screen. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see it uh, correctly. So, sorry, I need to move this, otherwise uh, is okay. Um, so I will uh, try to <laughs> conclude uh, this session uh, speaking about uh, the connection between uh, detection, prevention, compliance, harmonization and also data sharing. So um, somehow um, going uh, ahead with uh, the previous uh, uh, presentation, uh, but moving uh, um, mainly on uh, the um, creation of data uh, that can be useful with uh, many other strategies uh, to beat uh, fraud at global level. And uh, in this sense, uh, I think that a mixture or uh, a pasting between uh, instrument uh, uh, of uh, Internet of Things and, uh, and uh, data can be uh, the um, strategy for the future. I will uh, try to um, explain my experience uh, through the real case of uh, olive oil. Uh, so uh, we all know that the fraud occur when, uh, when uh, customers are deceived about the quality and the quality, one of the quality is the authenticity, uh, is part of the overall quality such as uh, the genuineness uh, that uh, is somehow overlapping uh, or uh, the uh, integrity. And uh, the fraud uh, is motivated by an undue uh, advantage. So uh, uh, for those uh, who are selling the food. Um, it can be related uh, to the product or the process when, for example, a process is not allowed and intentionally is generally not affecting food safety. However, uh, a risk in terms of food safety is always a secondary effect because we have a, an interruption of the traceability due to the document falsification, and this is the gap. This is uh, the problem when uh, we have this kind of interruption that opens up to any type of safety risk, such as mixing, contamination, or 
Anyway, we, we do not uh, know any more about the real story of the problem. Uh, the problem is also, there is a problem related with the fact that the consumer is not actually buying what he's thinking or you want, he wants. Uh, the second problem could be the food safety. The third one can be the fact of reputation because the uh, adverse uh, public health impact uh, is affecting the consumer's trust in food industries, in official control bodies, in governments. And uh, it's very costly because uh, every year is a question of 30 billion uh, every year. So it's uh, 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 the balance uh, of a small uh, uh, country in Europe uh, or, the or the public debt uh, of a million one. So uh, these are many different uh, types types of fraud, adulteration, uh, diversion, uh, uh, counterfeit, so con substitution, uh, creation of a fraudulent uh, product with a fraudulent uh, packaging. So when we uh, are not, uh, we are not actually uh, buying something that claims truly what it is. Uh, olive oil. Why olive oil is uh, uh, at the center of the, the circle somehow? No? The olive oil uh, is uh, um, one, or uh, we could say also the top healthy oil. Why? Because uh, of the composition of fatty acids and uh, specifically for the virgin or extra virgin for the content of uh, phenols, polyphenols, and also for the sensory aspects. So these uh, um, uh, characteristics uh, makes, uh, make uh, the uh, olive oil uh, being at uh, the uh, uh, top uh, healthy oils uh, uh, available on the market. Uh, so the uh, added value, uh, so the risk of uh, fraud is linked, is inherent and proportional to the added value and also to the high nutritional interest. We can add that uh, is mixable as any liquid, and so it's easy to, uh, to mix and uh, to transfer. Uh, and so um, a control of the volumes uh, is uh, of uh, uh, interest, uh, is very important. Also, we have many categories. Uh, often uh, the consumer is not knowing what uh, he or she buys. And uh, so, all the people want extra virgin olive oil, but that is the top category. So somehow is uh, uh, not, uh, um, it, it would be not the case to uh, say high quality as uh, uh, was uh, presented before, but uh, is, uh, Mm, frequent uh, high quality extra virgin olive oil because extra virgin olive oil is already the higher quality, but is the quality in which, or the category, sorry, in which all the categories are <laughs> inside in the perception of the consumer. So the consumer is often buying extra virgin olive oil paying less than the sustainable and possible value for a product that is not refined and should be top in terms of quality. Um, the instrument that the European Commission has 
put in, play, put in place are uh, the uh, uh, rapid alert system for food and feed that is much more related with the food safety. In some cases can be useful for the adulteration, but some product non-compliance are not well described in the existing classification or of the RASFF, which is not made for the uh, fraud. Uh, the uh, food EU food fraud uh, network and the um, administrative assistance and cooperation system were uh, created uh, in 2013 and 2015 to work together in synergy and to give information in terms of also mainly on fraud. Uh, the distinction be between the two systems is that RAF uh, members are obliged to, to notify and to exchange cross-border information because it's a question of safety. While the other two systems, the uh, Food Fraud Network and uh, the Cooperation System works uh, on voluntary basis uh, and uh, only for cross-border non-compliances or are not useful uh, for uh, national uh, non-compliance uh, in terms of uh, information. Uh, if we have a look at the um, uh, food fraud request of uh, assistance uh, at the administrative assistance and cooperation system, which is uh, Publish every year from 2016 to 2019, we can see that the number of requests for, of requests for assistance and cooperation shared by the member state tends to increase over the years. This is extremely positive because it is a way to share the problem. So an availability to share the problems uh, and so being able uh, to uh, control the situation uh, in EU. This is uh, the representation of uh, the top 10 uh, product categories uh, in the food fraud uh, network uh, in, uh, um, in 2019. And we can see that fats and oils is in the first position, followed by fish and fish products, meat and meat products. And we know that in the category fats and oils, in many cases, we have olive oil as one of the most notified products. There is a question also of geographical origin. We know that the prices uh, are different uh, by categories, uh, so different prices for the different categories, but different prices for the different origin. So this uh, uh, makes uh, possible, is an opportunity uh, for those uh, that wants to uh, make, make uh, counterfeiters, for counterfeiters, sorry. So, but uh, what are the most common in pigments in the olive oil sector? We can see that uh, uh, we try to uh, collect information uh, in this uh, area. Uh, and one is marketing virgin as extra virgin. Extra virgin is the top quality, no defect sense, obviously a, a number of uh, uh, also uh, chemical uh, um, uh, tracers that are included as uh, should be uh, um, better in terms of quality rather than uh, virgin. Uh, and blends uh, with uh, other vegetable oils. If we take uh, on the other side, uh, the monthly summary published by GRC from, uh, for example, from 2016 to 2019, uh, we can see that uh, we have many cases for fish, meat, wine, milk and dairy products, uh, but also 
32 cases for olive oil. What kind of fraud? Of 32 cases, 20 occur in the EU, 12 in non EU, and these are those uh, amply disseminated, declared. Uh, you see that we have substitution, mislabeling, dilution, and obviously the sum of the different types of fraud appears to be higher than the number of cases, because in many cases we have much more than one fraud. Uh, so these are reported that some uh, kind of uh, fraud, uh, substitution and mislabeling, uh, for example, uh, for Italy reported, or uh, uh, for Bra Brazil, a mixture of oil not fit for human consumption, or origin masking in Spain uh, when uh, olive oil produced in Syria was uh, Turkish, was uh, uh, exported uh, as Turkish. Uh, or, for example, in France, both uh, uh, falsely labeling and uh, the uh, uh, mixture with uh, other vegetable oils similar to olive oil. Here are reported uh, other examples of uh, um, uh, fraud. Uh, even, uh, for example, uh, false declaration in terms of uh, origin, uh, variety, or uh, uh, other claims that are not respected. Uh, during uh, the, uh, the Olium project uh, that uh, was uh, coordinated by University of Bologna and uh, uh, was uh, an answer to the call uh, that was published in 2014, uh, dealing uh, with uh, the olive oil quality and authenticity, we uh, sent uh, by email to, as, with, together with other actions, uh, a number of uh, um, uh, online survey uh, to, that were completed by uh, 111 uh, stakeholders, uh, different stakeholders such as uh, from different countries, official control bodies, uh, private uh, labs, uh, companies, retailers, uh, distributors, uh, uh, importers or exporters, asking the priority level of uh, the uh, fraud for them. And uh, we uh, add as um, priority level A uh, or B or C the uh, um, application of uh, technologies not allowed, uh, the blends with other vegetable oils, or the soft deodorization. So the possibility to remove uh, uh, weak sensory defects uh, to convert a virgin olive oil into extra virgin, obviously adding a, uh, an amount of extra virgin to uh, add uh, the uh, uh, olfactory notes of fruity. This is an example, for example, uh, sorry, is an example uh, of uh, perception from the academics, uh, from uh, the researchers, that is important, a kind of fraud, while for is not in, so important for official control body or uh, bodies or company or so. Sometimes we think that, uh, for example, the false declaration of the variety is a problem, but this deals uh, with. Uh, a small amount of product uh, that is uh, sold uh, all around the world. And the problems are mainly related with uh, the uh, medium quality of the high quality extra virgin olive oil. I know that is a paradox. Uh, I underlined this before, but uh, is the actual situation. Um, <coughs> So we need also to help uh, consumers uh, to 
make a, a correct choice. Uh, so to inform them in terms of how to make a correct choice. Also, we address a questionnaire to the EU Food Fraud Network uh, with the help of uh, <clears throat> the DG Agri and DG Sante um, with uh, the aim to acquire uh, reports, uh, consolidated reports on the occurrence, uh, not uh, the perception, but the occurrence of common and emerging fraud. And from uh, this uh, uh, questionnaire uh, that were uh, compiled uh, by uh, the member states, uh, uh, the mixing with lower quality olive oil, so a question of category, and the question of geographically origin, but in, in terms of oil from EU, non EU, and mix of EU and non EU in terms of claim on the label and also the false, the false designation of origin in terms of country. Here are reported some publication uh, in which is possible to find much more detail what I have presented in this part of my presentation. So what are the problems, the drawbacks, the uh, the problems in the analysis, uh, the recommendation for the future, and the possible countermeasures uh, for the future. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, detection, so instruments, methods, uh, uh, standard operating procedures, uh, calibration uh, available uh, for the global uh, quality control, both private and public, we have, uh, mm, uh, we, we thought to enhance the methodology for the sensory assessment of uh, virgin olive oils, which is uh, the uh, critical point, uh, mm, not always, but in many cases, uh, uh, for uh, the uh, quality control of virgin and extra virgin, because uh, the panel, uh, you see in the drawbacks in this slide, uh, uh, the panels uh, are uh, uh, um, groups of people and they have uh, uh, the possibility to assess a limited number of sample every day. And uh, uh, even if uh, they, uh, panel test is extremely important uh, uh, to uh, assess the quality of uh, an extra virgin olive oil because the sensory perception, uh, perception is extremely sensitive in terms of olfactory nodes, but uh, we have problems of calibration of the different panels and problems, so for example, of time in terms of number of samples that can be analyzed per day. For example, for a big company, we have numbers like 20,000 uh, uh, samples per year. So there is a problem in terms of uh, uh, controlling all these samples. So we proposed a number of instrumental approaches to enhance the methodology for the organoleptic assessment. So to detect the volatile profiling, both using um, method, targeted method that can be included in the actual regulation and also uh, thinking of the rapid screening method related with the panel test and related with the targeted methods and many other uh, non-targeted procedures, uh, uh, spectroscopy used in different uh, manners to be uh, complementary. Here, the procedure for uh, separative, uh, traditional, but sustainable in terms of selecting the minimum number of tracers, this is a targeted approach, that are diagnostic. So in a way to reduce the time to apply the analysis, both uh, with a uh, climate ionization detector, that is a detector that costs 
nothing <laughs> in terms of uh, instruments or uh, not highly uh, difficult to be um, to be in a, in a control lab and the mass spectrometry uh, to confirm the uh, structure uh, identification of the compound. The key of uh, the uh, um, uh, the method uh, in terms of being uh, quick and easily easily uh, applicable is uh, the selection of the volatiles, uh, the, the minimum number of volatiles, so 18, and uh, their um, uh, the, the creation of two uh, standard matrices to reduce the number of injection uh, needed uh, to build uh, the a robust classification. Uh, this uh, is uh, the validation uh, reported, uh, the, 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 the performance in terms of validation parameters for three molecules, for three volatile compounds. It's not reported uh, the all because uh, the method is in course of uh, publication. The second part, uh, the first uh, is uh, already published in food control. And uh, um, also in this case, it's possible to uh, scan uh, the article and all the articles are reported into the uh, uh, oleumproject.eu where uh, all uh, the data, the, um, the standard operative procedures, the calibration uh, are reported, uh, given that uh, uh, as uh, requested by the commission, uh, all uh, the material is available open access. Another possibility in this case uh, to enforce uh, the activity and uh, uh, ameliorate, ameliorate the proficiency of the panels all over the world was uh, the production of uh, two, but uh, we hope to produce more in future, reference materials uh, of the two, uh, two of the main uh, frequent defects uh, that we can found uh, in uh, virgin olive oils, wine vinegary and rancid. To recognize uh, them uh, correctly in uh, uh, different oils, these were produced uh, just for uh, an olfactory used, are used, are standards uh, um, that uh, were uh, um, uh, are not natural. So in uh, an oil uh, where selected uh, specific compounds uh, to be uh, diluted and to resemble the uh, olfactory note of wine and vinegar and rancid. Uh, both the um, way to align and obtain a better proficiency of the panel and to reproduce uh, this formulation in laboratory where in, in any labor lab were uh, published um, in open access and so are available uh, also to um, have an impact in terms of uh, um, uh, <laughs> quality and authenticity uh, of olive oil all over the world. This is uh, another approach when I said before that we need, okay, we need methods that can be included. So with uh, specific rules, uh, everything, uh, everything uh, in a condition to be perfectly validated uh, with the rules of ISO, but we need also to uh, put in place uh, uh, screening methods, uh, even if uh, they are um, semi-targeted or non-targeted, so method for which we do not have uh, a framework uh, for the validation actually. And this uh, uh, one of these uh, is uh, the application of uh, uh, a, a separation, a quick separation with a gas chromatograph ion mobility spectrometer, uh, which is uh, giving, uh, can give information uh, in terms of classification 
uh, that can be useful for uh, the uh, panels uh, to reduce the work of a panel or to prioritize their, the, the selection of the sample more, more at risk that should be analyzed first. Uh, the, this semi-targeted approach, as you see, has the possibility. Here we use the 15 volatile standards and uh, mm, two standard matrices, also in this case, and the possibility to identify the um, uh, um, presence uh, in terms of retention time and drift time of uh, the uh, monomer and the dimers uh, that uh, generally are produced of any volatile. So just uh, from many different uh, chemometric uh, elaboration were used here, but just to have a classification between main categories, so evil, extra virgin, or non-extra virgin, and within the non-extra virgin, virgin and lampante, knowing that lampante is not uh, edible without refining. So in this case, you see, we try to uh, make calibration, cross-validation, external validation, and also to relate and predict the defects uh, considering the relation between the uh, specific volatiles and their uh, olfactory notes or defects or positive attributes to which they can be related with. Um, so the pre-classification can be very useful as uh, said uh, before, and uh, can be used also, for example, in case of quality control, business to business. Um, when a company is asking, I, I have this calibration that can be my internal calibration and I want to see if your, your oil that you want to sell me is compliant or not with this. Uh, um, applying this analysis and uh, chemometric elaboration. Uh, so in this case, the production of quality is a question of prevention of quality. So uh, enforcement of uh, the, uh, the, the, the possibility of easy and easy quality control that can be requested by a company to preserve its reputation. Uh, another question that we face, um, I just uh, cite a number of actions that we have uh, done during the more than four years of the project because we asked uh, uh, six months uh, more um, in uh, last year for the COVID uh, uh, pandemic pandemic uh, is the Olion Data Bank. Uh, the Olion Data Bank is uh, the place uh, and is kept by the GRC where uh, we store the data, um, the validated data. Um, if uh, this will be adopted by national control bodies, uh, it will contribute to a re reduction to litigation, in litigation, because in, cas in case of that can be, a, how can I say, a, a, a proof of compliance, uh, can be useful also for, for the collaboration uh, between uh, quality control labs, um, it uh, can be uh, relevant also to contain reference values or compliant composition and uh, could be essential to confirm a fraud suspicion um, can be used uh, and so can be very um, uh, useful to um, uh, for both for the official control bodies uh, and uh, the private companies, uh, even uh, if they 
will have in future different possibility to assess. Uh, on the other side, we created also an oil network that without overlapping is a very liquid structure uh, with any uh, technical commission or a committee. Um, it's just a way to um, uh, have an exchange uh, between uh, stakeholders. Uh, it was extremely useful to recruit labs for the validation of the new methods that we publish to exchange information, to collect new problems and to communicate from different parts of the work and also to publish the question of the month that was a question dealing with uh, the control of the quality or the authenticity of the product, uh, answered by an expert and peer reviewed by another, because you know that sometimes the, uh, the experts are not all uh, of the same opinion uh, and also being uh, uh, in different parts of the world uh, can affect uh, the position that an expert can have. So the, the conclusion is uh, that anyway, in the EU, we have uh, a, 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 the most extensive and concrete regulation. Uh, the analytical technologies are appropriate, but with uh, some deficiencies, we try to answer to these uh, deficiencies. Uh, the level of attention, we should be able to say to the consumer that the level of attention and the high request in terms of conformity checks, the, the high control and the fact that the fraud are discovered is a, a, a way, a key to improve the quality it has been and is a key to improve the quality and to assure the authenticity on the global market. And it's important that in a EU that uh, uh, covers uh, the Mediterranean area is at the center of uh, this control. Um, a, and also uh, there is uh, still the need to ameliorate a conformity check, uh, checks to reduce uh, the cases of disagreement in the classification to improve proficiency and to uh, compose, to collect um, compliant composition, uh, to compile a data bank and to uh, make, make available uh, screening tools, rapid methods, uh, because we need to reduce uh, harmful and polluting solvents. So also, uh, and, be, uh, and we need also to be very rapid in the control of the quality. Uh, the strategy to beat uh, fraud at a global level are, were cited also before uh, by Terence Lau uh, in terms of other um, instrument that can be uh, used with the analytical data, but uh, in case in the case of olive oil, a joint strategy to combine sensory and instrumental data can be useful in case of disagreement, for, for example, between two panels and so to reduce the litigation and also the room for the counterfeiters an improvement of uh, the proficiency, because we say, uh, we often say that we have problem with the sensory aspects, but we have problems in the application of the methods in general. So problems of proficiency in general. So uh, improvement of the proficiency of the panels and uh, in the application of the methods. Um, and uh, also um, having and producing reproducible reference materials or uh, related uh, reference materials, such as those used for the uh, 
uh, instrumental analysis on the market. Uh, so there is a uh, room for the development uh, for the marketing of analytics also. A real, furthermore, real and virtual compliant composition should be stored in a repository to be used as a, a reference data, such as a, in the Olium data bank, but the same can be done for, for other food and used as quality and authenticity references. And also, finally, last but not least, uh, should I, I should say, we need to put in relation the traceability, so only a uh, blockchain scenario is, is, can solve this problem, relation with volumes, produce their geolocation. So having an intersection between official quality controls, data, and traceability, uh, and this uh, can be the next, uh, outside the actual regulation, the next uh, frontier. Uh, the next uh, uh, horizon uh, for the uh, as a, a countermeasure uh, to beat uh, uh, counterfeiters. So this is uh, all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tulia. So now, any questions? Marta. Yeah, well, first of all, um, to my colleagues, <laughs> please ask questions as well. It looks like I'm the only one that <laughs> is asking today. And second, to, to Professor Tochi, uh, thank you very much. It was really a pleasure to have you here. I'm very happy to see you again and, yeah. and uh, that you join us here. I, it's, it's really a pleasure and an honor. Um, I, I want to ask a couple of questions, mainly out of curiosity, I, um, I, about the Oleum project that I, I follow for some time. It's a very, very interesting project. Um, one of my questions is related with the uh, sensory panels. Um, uh, do you do you think or do you see a, a difference because uh, um, I, I I see that it's uh, very interesting to use them for uh, the differentiation between virgin and extra virgin uh, olive oil. Um, but I was wondering how, how is is when there is different varieties, for example, on the olives. Um, do they work always with the same type of varieties, or they they are able to discriminate with no problem between different? Uh, <laughs> The problem of variety is uh, more complex because, uh, uh, because uh, it is hard to uh, be able to certify a variety from the oil, from the final oil. Could be yeah. done with uh, DNA methods, but actually we do not have uh, or at least uh, it was what we have verified with Olium, a method that uh, is uh, easily to be applied, is enough uh, sensitive. And in many cases we have found, we, not me directly, but the groups that worked uh, on these techniques, uh, that uh, the possibility to find human DNA is higher than the uh, DNA of the different varieties that can pollute or contaminate or can be added uh, uh, for fraud to the one that is the main one. Consider that uh, it, when you say is a monovarietal olive oil, uh, mm -hmm. you refer to an olive oil, extra uh, virgin generally, that uh, has 90% this variety. So you have already inside a number, minimum number of other varieties. So this is very hard to be uh, certified uh, without maybe the traceability. 
and uh, it is the only, uh, actually the only possibility that we have. So uh, a way to certify the volume produced from uh, this uh, variety in the certain in a certain region, country, and so on. Okay, thank you very much. Another question is. Um... Uh, since, well, in INL, we work in a lot in the miniaturization of analytical methods. And I, I see the, the high interest that is in rapid methods and, and, and um, um, yeah, as a screening methods and so on. Which targeted methods do you envision or do you think it would be um, possible to to uh, and, and there will be an interest on miniaturized for decentralized analysis as a screening method. Do you do you see any any of the targeted methods? GC EMS can be miniaturized. Uh, the MS uh, spectroscopy can be miniaturized. Surely, in future, spectrometric uh, procedure can be much more applied uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, mm, I, I, I cannot say cameras, but uh, with uh, systems of uh, 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 detection of uh, absor uh, transmission of, of or uh, absorption of light. Uh, even if we do not have, I think, to be mm, uh, to give to the consumer the idea that they, they can control the quality and authenticity of the food uh, by themselves, uh, because this is not the, the reality. We have uh, included one method that should be um, uh, from a company that was uh, inside the consortium uh, claiming to be able to detect uh, easily polyphenols, but we were not able to have uh, uh, for polyphenols, while it was possible for tocopherols, uh, a, a, a method that uh, can be considered enough robust. So otherwise, uh, the consumer is expecting or is uh, um, as the idea to be able already to control the quality by uh, himself. And this uh, would be, uh, on my opinion, uh, I, of high risk uh, of uh, um, distortion of the information, the same distortion of information that we are uh, finding now with the COVID. <laughs> in another way. So on my opinion, it will be uh, possible. We need to uh, start to go ahead to study uh, methods or miniaturize methods or, or to make easier uh, methods of control, but uh, with the timing of the validation. I, I fully, I fully agree. I fully agree with you, and I, I, I fully agree that the. I mean, I uh, we we normally envision these miniaturized devices and methods for the use of for industry or laboratories of control to make um to make a check uh, on the spot, let's say. And I fully agree with you because I've been told many times, why don't you go for consumers and so on? And I fully agree with you that that could be very tricky, you know, because they, they don't know how to interpret the results and they don't really, that would be a, a very tricky question. I, uh, yeah, you are completely, I mean, I fully agree with, with this point, yeah. We, we do not, on my opinion, we do not have to be, how can I say, uh, to resist uh, the idea that we can go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, even uh, on my opinion, we, we are not uh, at the time, so the consumer is not enough informed. This is the starting point. Uh, it's not the question of uh, instruments uh, they can use. They are not really knowing a label. Yeah. Or, or a category. 
So this is our responsibility, uh, but uh, somehow is uh, the responsibility also of the producer distribution. So if we are able to involve also them uh, in uh, the problems or of reputation, maybe we are able to grow up all together. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tulia. Thank you very much uh, to all the participants, uh, uh, all the speakers, Heinen, Hakan, Terence. Uh, uh, it was a really nice and interesting uh, session. Uh, uh, I think that uh, that uh, uh, fits very well with the with the. Uh, propose and the aim of the summer school. So uh, I think that we have to to repeat and to to read it uh, in in the future. This kind of of uh, models of uh, uh, because are really really interesting. Um, just to uh, before to close the the session uh, this morning, uh, just to uh, remember that uh, uh, we have this uh, social. Uh, activities uh, online <laughs> uh, uh, after lunch. Uh, remember that uh, we have a quiz uh, and the, the winner of the quiz uh, will have uh, as a, a, a fantastic prize. It's a basket of plenty of uh, uh, very nice uh, food products uh, from here, from, from Portugal. Uh, so please, uh, uh, don't hesitate to participate in the in the quiz. We have as well uh, a wine. Uh, uh, one important thing is to put the wine in the fridge now, uh, <laughs> because this is a, a, a wine that uh, uh, must be served uh, uh, cold uh, with the knowledges that will uh, will. Um, advice uh, about uh, the, the the consumption of the of the wine and uh, and this is uh, this is all uh, from from my side so thank you very much all the participants as well that uh, uh, attend uh, to the to, to this meeting and um, see you in after lunch okay thank you thank you very much see you at two then for two weeks time Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. If you want, we can start. Uh, I am already in. Yeah, Somebody. maybe Phil. Just to show you first the uh, what I had prepared. I was going to share the the price so that you can be a little bit more motivated. Although you 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 saw it yesterday, so it's uh, products from the north of Portugal. So two bottles of wine, one cheese, and a few cans of products from from the I mean from Portugal also, like sardine, but then some uh, tuna. Well, tuna I don't know where it is from, but but it's some cans from from Portugal. Premium products. Yeah. Delicatessen. Very nice. Yeah, we should decide. I mean, maybe as we are few, I don't know if we like uh, people from the consortium can participate or not. Okay, so please introduce the ping. And you need to put your name, otherwise we will not know who you are. But maybe we can all play. Lorenzo, what do you think? Uh, be... I, <laughs> um, I suggest, um, so how many participants uh, we are? Uh, one, two, okay. Hi, good afternoon. Hello. Hello. I think the issue is if one of us wins, then I will have to look at the ranking then. So the real winner will be one of the real uh, actual participants who, who ranks the highest. Okay, good, good. <laughs> I think good we point. can do that, right? Exactly. So yeah. all of us, all of us, we participate, but the winner will be uh, uh, 
well, yeah, one of the attendees. The highest ranking participant. But then in yeah, that case, right. make sure that I think in the end you have to really make sure that you don't skip the ranking list. So don't click too fast. That always happens to me. <laughs> okay. Okay, so logging in. Lon, we get to play the quiz. Oh, nice. <laughs> Look what I've got. <laughs> very good, Lan, very good. <laughs> me too. I couldn't find Mateo, I found Casa Mendes. <laughs> it's similar, no worries. <laughs> okay. Okay, I will not participate because I know I have been like handling the questions. <laughs> okay, I'm going to participate. I'm going to well. participate. <laughs> so, Lorenzo, a bit you, randomly, but, uh, do you want me to read the questions or? Yeah, I can, I can, I can read the questions. Yeah, and participate at the same time. We yeah, just have. I, I, I can do everything. We just have 20, 20 seconds to reply for each of them. There are 20 questions, 20 seconds each of them. Okay, so Nuria, I, I'm going to participate, please. Could you read the, the, the yeah. question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can make some comments. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so shall we start? Yes, please. So first question, let's go. Wow. It's about I'm speed. Nervous. Yeah. I am nervous. <laughs> you have to be fast. I'm super fast. <laughs> <laughs> what is the term for not needed a centralized coordinating organization to approve transactions when using blockchain? Immutability, decentralization, disintermediation, or distribute? I I, uh, I I I I make a mistake. I I was trying to uh, to, uh, to to click in the in the Zoom, not in the in the. <laughs> really, <laughs> but it's actually I don't think it's correct. <laughs> really, I think I just randomly hit one. It was right. <laughs> I think it's supposed to be disintermediation, but uh, we'll go for distributed then. Okay. <laughs> Oh, polemic. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next question. What is the third stage of the smart farming cycle in which actuators are used to remotely operate objects? Smart control, smart farming, smart analysis, or smart planning? Control. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this? Gero? No. Gianmarco. Gianmarco. <laughs> wow. Gianmarco. Very good. Very good. Which of these is not a key element of a blockchain use case? Problem or opportunities address, compensation of cost, blockchain technology applied, or governance benefits? If you read your emails well, you might be able to know. Compensation of cost. Hey, Gianmarco again. Gianmarco is a very, very heavy... No, no, it's just... <laughs> participant. Those I, I responded uh, randomly. <laughs> so... How many layers are in a blockchain technology stack? Seven, three, five, nine. This is easy for the participants. Yeah. <laughs> they should be going up in the ranking. I see Aldion is also here. Are you playing Aldion? Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I'm joining in now. A little bit late, but it's fine. Okay. Oh, gosh. Wow, Gianmarco, Gianmarco. <laughs> Which is which of the following is not the main areas in blockchain application on the digital layer? IT automation, data economy, data science, or remote sensing? Remote sensing. Wow. Lang. <laughs> wow, Lang, Lang. It's not fair. <laughs> I was on a streak. <laughs> what type of analytics is the expected number of INRs in 2030? Descriptive analytics, predictive analytics, diagnostic analytics, or prescriptive analytics? <laughs> Predictive analytics. Lan, <laughs> you knew it. Oh, <laughs> Lan, you are closer. Inside the the trading. <laughs> what is not a driver for applying blockchain in agriculture? So very inclusive and transparent, food supply chain efficiency and safety. Optimize processes inside organizations for food system sustainability and resilience. Optimize process inside organizations. Wow. Learn again. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Which of these use cases can a blockchain clearly help with? Business processes automation involving independent partners, making a database resistant, resistant against hackers stealing information, safely storing a company's secret documents, or submitting information to a government authority. First one. Very well. <laughs> wow, wow. Lang, Lang. I decided to play random. You have, you have to share your, your, the basket with all of us. <laughs> Which of the following is not an advantage of blockchains over centralized systems? Lan again. <laughs> oh, I thought I made a mistake. <laughs> Lan, you are on fire. I am. I'm in party mode. <laughs> what is the distinctive property of a permissioned blockchain? I don't read because this way you can focus more, I think. Very well, many good replies. Dan? <laughs> what is the distinctive property of a permissionless blockchain? Very well, everyone. Wow. And Gianmarc, no, Gero is the uh, coming up. Finally. 
<laughs> I am lonely on top. <laughs> what is the distinctive property of a public blockchain? So anyone can read the ledger. Ah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Gero knows very well these questions. Yes. <laughs> well, we have still possibilities. What is the distinctive property of a private blockchain? Very good, everyone. And Ghetto is the first one now. <laughs> the main characteristics of the food value chain are. So none of the both. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> remember that the, the price uh, have to be consumed here in Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would not mind that business trip that I've entered this project for. <laughs> what is the Git command to get the latest updates from your colleagues? I thought Patrick got up. <laughs> okay. Which of the following is a software principle that you should apply when writing a program? Right. Don't repeat yourself in case. <laughs> hey, Marta. Wow, Marta. Mm -hmm. Marta, it's not nice if the price uh, uh, to the host <laughs> for, for uh, uh, at INL. <laughs> What is the formula for a non Genesis block? That was difficult, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Last two ones. What's the phone number for new blockchain projects at Wageningen University Research? <laughs> Very good, coach. One, one, two. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it had to be Oranje, apparently not. <laughs> okay. Very well. So last one. What can sensors be used for in the context of food safety? So Yay. let's see who is the winner. 
<laughs> Carol. The yeah. winner is <laughs> so. <laughs> you really have to make the trip, Ah, no, Carol. one last question. Which is of the following is not a biosensor? Sorry. Very well. Now make sure you get the full list of uh, <laughs> of ranking. Ooh, wow! Wow! <laughs> wow. <laughs> Get Get up. Up. Get up. <laughs> so do Whatever we know who is... the economic questions that Lan should submitted. take the picture. Philippa, do we know who is the the real winner that uh, that is not part of the partnership? Well, you should be seeing it. Do you have a button somewhere to see the full ranking? Or I will check that, and I will tell you in a minute. Oh, great. <laughs> Philippa is cooking. Philippa is cooking the, the real winner. <laughs> Way to include this in our deliverables. <laughs> this is this is uh, something not really transparent. <laughs> not all, not all. But so it's totally accountable. No blockchain there. <laughs> <laughs> So, Nuria, what happened to the economic questions that Lan submitted? The, I think there were some, no? Yeah? No, I dropped it. Ah, okay. Uh, that, that, that gave me a chance. For myself. <laughs> I see that Antonio is already here. Hello. Just wait for us two minutes till we know the winner of the quiz. How are you all? Very good. <laughs> Here enjoying <laughs> the quiz. Philippa, are you cooking the, the, the winner? Hi, how are you? Hello, Natasha. Hi, Hi Natasha. Natasha. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> sorry, just a minute. I'm not able to see the others. Just a minute, sorry. Go on, go on. <laughs> okay, we, we can pass to the to the um, uh, uh, to the wine, and after the wine, we will we will know uh, who was the 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 winner. A part of Gero, of course. <laughs> okay, do you agree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. perfectly. Okay, so uh, well, first of all, let me introduce uh, Antonio Braga and Natasha Fontes. Uh, they they came from Sogrape. Sogrape is the company that produced. Uh, the wine that uh, we going to use to to this uh, uh, to this experiment. So uh, for me, it's the first time that uh, I am doing this kind of thing, so virtual. So uh, the idea uh, is to learn a little bit how to taste, how to appreciate the different uh, uh, characteristics of of a wine. And for this purpose, we have. Uh, 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 the, the 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 best uh, ones that we can found <laughs> here in in, in Portugal uh, to uh, uh, to show us how to to taste the the wine. Um, as you know, wine is uh, an use case uh, in our product of blockchain. Uh, so it's an opportunity as well to uh, 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 to mix all together. So blockchain uh, learnings. And of course, uh, uh, to enjoy uh, uh, a, a very good wine and to warm a little bit uh, in this uh, end of, of the summer. So uh, please, the floor is yours, Antonio, Natasha. Uh, uh, please, uh, it's up to you to, to explain. Okay, thank you. Um, so we are here today. I don't know, everyone has a bottle of, of the wine? Yeah. You have it? Oh great! Oh, Lawrence, you don't have the right uh, glass. I'm sorry to say. I, I am. I am a Tyenel, so this is the, <laughs> this is the, the best that I, I manage. <laughs> but it makes a huge difference uh, having the correct uh, glass. It makes a huge different difference in in tasting a wine because all the geometry of of the glass it's very important when we're tasting a lot of the the things that we we sense 
are volatile compounds uh, and you should have a geometry in your glass that helps to release those volatile compounds in one hand and in the other hand that helps them to to retain a little bit those volatile compounds when your nose uh, it's in the glass if your if your glass is very open like a, a, a traditional glass what will happen is that uh, you will have more uh, trouble in, in swirling your wine throughout the glass. So you will have more problems to volatize all the aromatic compounds. And in the other end, you will have problems also because when you put your nose in the, into the glass, the aromas will, will be lost. Uh, and in this kind of geometry, uh, it makes sense. Also, another thing, and this is not to, to make a joke of you, Lorenz, sorry. Uh, I'm just I'm just focusing because you are you are asking me to to give you some notions of wine tasting. So I'm starting by the glass. Um, also, another thing that's important. It, it may seem that's not very important, but it is. It's the the um, the thickness uh, or the, or should be the 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 very low thickness of a of a wine glass. So they should be very thin um, in order for you to have a, a better relationship with the liquid. Otherwise, um, you will be lost in a huge amount of glass and you will not uh, add the right sensation when the glass goes into your, your mouth. So, okay, so that, that was the alternative. Sorry. <laughs> That's even worse. worse, even worse. That's sorry, good. sorry, I made a mistake. <laughs> um, another, another important and, and, and crucial thing into the wine tasting is the temperature of wine. Um, because that temperature also will will affect um, a lot the, the volatilization of the, the aromatic compounds for in one hand in the other hand it will affect the flavor of the wine because it will influence the way that you feel acidity and sweetness so very important and then in, in in the in the red wine so very important also the the, the wine temperature uh, for you to have a, a correct feeling of of the wine so in, in a wine like this one, a rosé wine, uh, uh, this one is our Mateus Rosé, and I will tell you the, the story in, in a minute. Um, we are always looking at the temperature uh, uh, right after the fridge. So I would say to keep the wine in the fridge, uh, the fridges are around four degrees Celsius. So we are here um, expecting a temperature around six, eight, nine. So around that, okay. Uh, I don't know how much time do I have for this, this activity. Would be what half an hour, twenty-five yeah. minutes. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. okay. Twenty-four, uh, twenty, thirty minutes. Yeah. It's... Okay, that's great. Just for me to have an idea. Um, before before got into the the testing itself, let me just so um, present you a little bit the wine in the company. Um, so this was this wine was created in nineteen forty two. So it will it the next year it will be the eighth eighth birthday of this wine. Which is amazing for 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 wine like this one. Back in that time, um, there were not so many brands of wine. Uh, there were a lot of wine. People who were, especially in Portugal, we will we'll had wine as a as like as a food in our table. Sometimes they didn't have brand at all. At all. And this wine was uh, based on a, a concept of a brand since the beginning. So the idea since the beginning was to make a wine that were very, very close, that was very, very close to the consumer and to the consumer profile. It was quite innovative because it was a rosé wine. Uh, back then, the rosé wines did not have, didn't, didn't have this, this quality. So uh, it was quite aromatic at the beginning, a little bit spritzy and uh, with some residual sugar. Residual sugar, which is the sugar that after the ferment, it's natural sugar, after the ferment stays into the wine. So just for you to have an idea, the yeasts uh, are transforming during the fermentation sugar into alcohol. Basically, they, they pick up 17 grams of sugar per liter and they transform that 17 grams per sugar uh, of sugar in one degree of alcohol. And if you stop the ferment somehow, somewhere during the fermentation, these starts stop fermenting and they, left, they leave sugar in the, into the wine, okay? So in this case, when we started with this wine, uh, the wine had 21 grams of sugar per liter. Um, nowadays it has, it has 15. So the style has been evolving a little bit. It has 80 years old. So we have, we have been making some, some changes to adapt to the consumer, but still it's a rosé wine with some spritziness, 
made out of Portuguese white uh, uh, red varieties uh, from all over Portugal. It's not from a specific DOC. It's from all over the country um, in order to keep and maintain a style that's, um, that's the same throughout the vintages. It does not have vintage at all. So it's a non-vintage wine. So we, we, make, we make it basically almost all the same during, during the year, okay? This is important because this is a different style of wine. When we look at a, like a, a specialist fine wine from a specific terroir, that wine should have a, a, a vintage year and should change, should change in style uh, year on year. And this one not here. We want to deliver consistency, freshness, the same style throughout the history of the brand and of the wine. Okay, so different kind of positioning into the wine, into the wine industry. And this one is a wine that I would say more um, close to the to the consumer and to the consumer preferences. It's still today a, a success. So we sell it in in 120 countries, more than 120 countries, and some bottles of it, of it. So and it's the wine that um, allowed us as a company to grow and to go abroad to other regions, to other countries. Uh, and to produce different different styles of wine. Nowadays, we are we are in Portugal, of course, but in Spain as well, Argentina, Chile, New Zealand, uh, as as a producer, as with wineries and with people over there producing producing wine. Uh, so nowadays, we have this this international uh, presence throughout the, the the wine world. What's okay? the volume nowadays? Uh... We produce around twenty one million bottles today. Okay, so it's a it's a it's a big a big uh, a big volume of wine, um, all from Portugal um, and very I would say consumer friendly. Um, and I think that's it in terms of in terms of of brand and in terms of company. Um, I think I made a, 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 a simple introduction. Of course, if you have any questions at the end, you can you can we can go back to the, to to that. But now I would I would pass on to the tasting. So if you if you want to to pour some wines in your glass, and you'll see right away that you see some some spritziness uh, forming on on your glass. You'll see some some CO2. This is a mix of natural and added CO2. So just for you to have an idea, just before bottling, we we just level up the CO2 to the standard of the brand. This is more important than to have a completely natural CO2, which would be somehow uh, different throughout the, the, the year. And here we have always the same, the same feeling of CO2. It's a, a physical process, not, not a chemical one. And then the first thing that one sees is, should, be, should be the visuals. And here in this case, we have this, this, pale, this pale to, to solid, um, rose color, uh, very clear, almost it's it's brilliant uh, in terms of aspect. It's quite clear, and then the aromatics should be very intense, very red fruit focused, like strawberry, like wild berries, like um, gooseberry. Should be those kind of aromatics. I prefer. So this is this the, the aromatic part of the wine. It's it's a, a great exercise for memory. Um, often one says that the best taster is not one the one with the best nose, but the one with the best memory, because aromatics is all about relating relating things that once we smelled and now we're smelling again and giving names to those things. It's not in terms of of um, human capabilities of smell. It's a little bit like like seeing or hearing of course we have people that see amazingly well and we have blind people also but those are the hands of a, a normal distribution so in terms of aromatics is exactly the same we have basically 90 percent of us we have the same ability the thing is that nowadays if you want to get better in smelling something you should train yourself as as everything else when we were kids and if no one told us the difference between Two kinds of greens when we were looking at the green we did not 
we didn't know how to name those kinds of greens. And we were seeing two different kinds of greens, but we did not know the names of those greens. And this is the same in terms of aromatics. We can feel different things, but sometimes we cannot name those different things. So we must train ourselves. There are some easier ways to do it. If you go to a, a spice um, a shop and you smell different spices, you start learning the different smells of the different spices. If you smell coffee, black pepper, white pepper, uh, nutmeg, you will feel a lot of differences. If you feel all the citrus that you have, like orange, grapefruits, lime, lemon, lime, you will know that they are quite different. But if you just speak about citrus, it's okay as well, but you are just zooming out. So if you want to train yourself, um, and if you are interested on, on, on those kind of, of, uh, of things, you should, you should train yourself, you should taste with, with people that know how to taste and, and to, to learn and to record in your memory what a lime tastes and what's the difference between a lime and, and an orange. Because uh, when you know it, then it will be easier to, 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 to make that into the wine. So we are, we are all in the, in the red fruit uh, environment. So the color tells us that should be red fruit and it is. Sometimes the color, it's different from the, the aromatic style, but in this case, no, we will feel the same, the same aromatics that one sees in color. So it's red fruit, it's strawberry, like fresh strawberry, not very ripe strawberry, but more on the fresh strawberry. It's cherry as well. It's a fresh wine, but with this, this red fruit kind of character. And then in the mouthfeel, we will feel some sweetness, some, some back palate sweetness. It will, the, when it goes into our mouthfeel, it's quite easy to drink, quite, quite, especially in a day like this. We are in the, we are in the north of Portugal, uh, in the Minho region, which is north from Porto, 50 kilometers north from Porto. Uh, between Porto and Spain. It's a very, very beautiful sunny day, uh, some kind of warm. So it feels good when we have this wine in our, in our yeah, mouth. It's fresh. It's, it's fresh. Yeah. Good acidity. Uh, some, some residual sugar that frames everything. So it takes, makes the wine quite easy. And once again, we have this uh, aromatic uh, way of feeling the, the, the food and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the beverage in, in our mouth, which is the retronasal um, uh, pathway uh, that you will feel on the back, on the back of, your, of your palate. There's a, a, a funny exercise to, to be made, which is tasting a wine with your nose closed and you will not feel anything, any aromatic. Yeah. It's even difficult to swallow but you don't feel anything. It's like neutral. So that's the effect when you don't have that, that's the effect of, of having the, all the aromatics coming from the, the retronasal. And one finds that's very important, those, that pathway that we often forget, which is quite in fashion nowadays because I heard that people who, who, with COVID lost uh, their, their yeah, senses. The, the sense of the and that's because the, the, the retinal laser was not uh, working properly, so... And actually, because the virus is affecting the, the sensors okay. we have, so the, the receptors for the, the aromas. Maybe we can use the wine, uh, this retronasal uh, characteristic of the wines as a therapy for, for yeah. COVID uh, patients. <laughs> <laughs> and also for men mental therapy, right? As well, as well. We are very well. nice therapy. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, by the way, uh, Antonio, good just, spirit. Just, <laughs> just a question regarding this sparkly uh, uh, characteristic in the in the mouth. So that uh, uh, determine more sweetness or more acidity, or is or the the sparkly is is, is nothing to. Uh, it's not related with the with other sensory characteristics. It's a it's a very good question, Lorenzo. Uh, in fact, when you whenever you have uh, spritziness into your wine, the thing is that that spritziness will somehow make a synergy with the acidity and the, with the freshness part of the wine. 
so the wine will look uh, fresher, crispier, okay? More, so it will push a little bit the acidity out, which in a case like this one, where we want to have a refreshing wine, a wine that's refreshing, that's for easy moments with your friends, it's not for like a very heavy food in, in the oven. No, it's, it's, a, it's a fresh wine, it's a crispy wine. The spritziness helps that sensation. So it's a very well um, made question. And I, and I, I take advantage of the fact to, to open up the, the questions because in terms of tasting, I, I went through the wine. So if you have any more questions to add to this one of Lorenzo, please feel free to, to add those questions. I have a question about the form and the shape of the bottle. Um, I, I'm, sadly, I don't have the wine. I'm tasting a white wine, it's probably a Chardonnay. But um, um, so when I was looking on the internet to see where I could get it short notice, <laughs> um, I saw that there are older uh, bottles of this wine for sale on the internet. So is it like a collector's item? Yeah, it is. It, it, the wine was quite famous and it's still famous nowadays um, in, the, in the 70s, 80s in the US and the UK. Uh, let me just give you some examples. So the, the inspiration for the wine, sh the bottle sh shape was, was from, so this one is in 42. So we were, we were in the second world war and the inspiration was the, the canteen used, used for, for carrying water by the soldiers. Okay. Mm. So this was a small bottle they were carrying around transporting water. Though, so that was the idea. So, but some, some anecdotal facts about a bottle. Uh, the wall was smaller than this one, the original one. So basically in terms of marketing, and this is a case study, uh, the supermarkets were buying the wine, but the wine was a small, smaller bottle. So they had to put the wine in front of the others so the consumer could see the bottle. So it was like a, a market positioning, but uh, just only by the, the, the bottle shape and not the company was not buying shelf space. Yeah, the bottle was different, nice. and so they, they had to put the bottle in front of the others. So that was a good one. Mm -hmm. um, another one, the bottle was quite used to make uh, lamps. Um, sorry. Um, um, how do we second yet? Yeah. Uh, Candles? Sorry? Candles? No, no, no. For putting a lamp in, on top of it and, 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 and to, to brighten the chandelier. Chandelier, so not, not a chandelier a, because it's yes. well. Uh, but it was, it was used for that because the bottle was quite original. And another thing that I just learned this last year, um, the conical shape of the, of the, the top of the bottle. Uh, so this one was, and it's still Elton John as, as the name of this wine in one of his lyrics and Sting just uh, a couple of months ago said this was the wine that he, he had he was to drink when he was on tour and Jimi Hendrix we have some pictures of Jimi Hendrix having wine from the bottle and the, the fact is that they would cut the top part of the bottle because it's conical and it fits right into your finger and they would play slide guitar with yeah. this so if you check on the internet you'll find some original Matthews bottle uh, top of the bottle <laughs> selling for playing music nowadays and they are very expensive uh, so because they have, they have it had the right shape for for playing slide guitar so it's 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 a fun this fact. story this story is amazing so yeah. the, the wine is not only is good for COVID it's as well for playing music so <laughs> it's incredible Lawrence. if you go if you go through the internet and this one is a new I have a friend which is a musician and sent me this story by email and I, I was not believing so nowadays there is people buying old bottles of Mateusz to cut the top of the bottle and place like slide guitar, which is that guitar with, with a, this, this amazing sound, uh, which is incredible. I, I play guitar, I'm going to try. <laughs> the thing is that you should, that's not easy to cut the top of the, of the bottle. You know, I know. Well. <laughs> Ask someone who works with glass to make it, but search, search on the internet, you will find it. <laughs> Since you're discussing the, the bottle shape, so first of all, interesting. So the, the bottle reminds me of uh, what is called a box beutel in the Franconia region of Germany. Um, different color, they typically have a green colored and probably some a slightly different shape, but uh, you're nodding. It's... Yes, it's true. I, I, I know those bottles from Frank, from the, the region of Franken, and they are mm -hmm. very, so especially when you look at the original bottle of Mateusz, they are quite uh, similar. Mm -hmm, right. And then I'm wondering if I'm the only one who has a screw top. 
because I see yours looks more like a yeah our a our as a a cork yeah I'm envious now. it has to do with, with the market preferences so whenever we have a market that chooses or or prefers screw cap we we sell with screw cap and and in Portugal which is the the land of the corks of course the consumer uh, it's connected cork. it's connected with cork so so we we bottle it uh, with cork. In my in my perspective as a winemaker, for this kind of wine style, it doesn't matter as long as the cork is good. Uh, the screw cap works perfectly, and the, and the cork as well. So this kind of wine, which is a wine that one should not age at home, it will yeah. it will evolve good. Uh, but it's better uh, when we have it young and fresh. So one should not cellar it, uh, and we have we should drink it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, Antonio, could you explain a little bit uh, about this uh, marriage? Uh, uh, why uh, one type of one kind of wine is better for fish, or is better for meat, or is better for um, other other meals? So, uh, how works this uh, this? Uh, uh, it's a marriage. So. <laughs> <laughs> I must tell you, Lorenz, that that we. we in the past, we have more more rules than we have today. So basically, uh, before people were always thinking about uh, red wines for meat and white wines for for fish, uh, that would be the general rule. And um, nowadays things uh, change a little bit. I think the rule nowadays is have what you what you prefer. Uh, and I I really uh, prefer uh, connecting the wine with the way that you make your food. I will translate. Um, instead of having a division between meat and fish, if you have a division by, by how do you make the, the food, we can compare much better a carpaccio with a ceviche or with a poke or with a sashimi, and it's meat and, and, and fish. Uh, and in these kind of foods that are more close to the product, more raw foods, more fresh foods, I would say that cooler, fresher, crispier wines like this one, like a, a, a white from a, a cool region, like a, a, even a red from a cool region. So wines with a good acidity um, uh, style would pair much better with this kind of fresh, cool foods, like also a salad, a salad with, with shrimp or, uh, or a chicken salad. Um, so those kind, those kind of, 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 of food. So I'm not worried about the type of protein. I'm worried with the work that is made on that protein. If you have an oven food, like a, a roasted um, um, uh, pork um, or, or a roasted uh, fish, like a, a, in, in the oven, uh, those, are, those are kind of foods that ask you for a wine with more tannins that cleans up your palate, that fights with the, with the fat. There are foods with a lot of fat. They have olive oil or they have butter or they have, or even the protein is fat, like the, those fishes or, the, or those pork foods. So whenever you have fat and it's cooked fat, you should have uh, maybe wines with more tannin. And it could be uh, like a, an old white uh, where you don't have so much tannin, but you have the effects of the aging and the, uh, uh, a white that's with weight, with, den with, with density, with texture, and also a red with those characteristics. So focus, first of all, whatever you like. Second, try to understand how the food is made and how can I um, add here a layer of wine to make one of two things, Lorenzo, and this is the complicated part, but we would need more than half an hour to discuss it. There are two ways of, of connecting food uh, with wine. The easiest way, it's by uh, putting together those kind of things, um, like the sashimi and the fresh white wine, okay? Those are in the same, in the same direction, but you can make, and when it works, it's, much, it's, it's amazing, when you go by opposites, like a vintage port, and uh, very dark with 95% uh, chocolate. So those are, are in different, in different uh, sizes. So it's by approximation or by deviation, there are two ways of connecting food with wine. 
but that's it. I, I would, we would need a little bit more minutes to, to go yeah, through yeah, and probably a table uh, with different foods and different wines. Uh, and that would be a, a wonderful experience. Yeah. I, I, I have a question more related with the summer school. Uh, you at the Sogrape, you produce uh, Porto wine. Porto wine is probably one of the most uh, reputed and famous uh, wines in, in the world. So do you have uh, problems uh, re related with uh, uh, counterfeiting, fraud? Uh, um, how are you facing this uh, problem if you have this problem? We, ha we have some problems. We have a very iconic brand in Portugal called Barca Velha which is very important in Portugal, but also in Angola and Brazil. And we have in that specific wine, it's a table wine, it's not a port wine. Uh, in that specific wine, we have some, some people trying to imitate our wines and we made some, some adjustments to the bottle with a special um, seal made by the, the Portuguese Institute of, the, of Money um, to, to, to guarantee the, the, the authenticity of each bottle. Um, but that's one specific case of Barca Velha. In port wine, we deal much more with uh, origins that call a wine similar to port as port. So port, it's a DOC, like champagne is a DOC, and one should not be allowed to make champagne in Portugal. We make sparkling wine, okay? We make sparkling wine in Portugal, and in champagne, they made a sparkling wine called champagne. And we make a wine in Portugal from a specific region called port, and in California, should not be allowed to produce a wine called port. They can call it fortified wine or whatever they want, but sh they should not call it port. In fact, there's a law nowadays that doesn't allow them to, to do that anymore. But the style itself, for instance, in Australia, you have wonderful fortified wines made in the port style. They are very good. And in blind tasting, can, can mix uh, a well-trained taster and a well-trained taster can be mis misconfused with a, with a, a, a good fortified Australian wine and uh, a port wine. Yeah. So I, I, I don't bother if anywhere ever in the world someone is making good fortified wines. I don't like them to call it port. Yeah. Yeah, but Maybe. just to, to add something, uh, there are many ways to try to avoid that. Uh, the fraud thing is uh, an important issue, but we have uh, IVDP, which is an organization that... Um, is the institute that controls the yeah. port wine? And the uh, sales. Um, we have a, um, an authenticity um, label. Label, yeah, thank you. Um, that in some way it regulates that part. So there are many... Uh, and Barca Velha is a, really a, a problem because it's a very expensive wine and everyone wants to, and at this moment, everyone wants to get a bottle of Barca Velha. So <laughs> it's, a, uh, and in Barca Velha, besides the, 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 the strategy that uh, Antonio spoke about, even the, the bottle is a special one, uh, serigrafada, I don't know how to say in English. Um, and, um, well, that's pretty much what what we do. I know that we you are trying to look for uh, sensors and stuff like that to to try to <laughs> to avoid that <laughs> and to put that into our industry. Um, but it's not an issue, a critical issue, let's say. Okay. Okay. Good. So, uh, Nuria, I don't know. We have. Um... Three minutes left uh, to the uh, to the end of the of the of the session. Uh, I suggest uh, uh, two things. Uh, first of all, um, uh, skip the the virtual tour. We can put the uh, a timer. We can put the the address of the uh, the link for doing the the virtual tour. You can do the tour yourself. Uh, um, uh, it's, it's easy. And uh, the, the alternative is to, uh, to, to attend to the second edition that will be presential, that will be physical. And uh, next year, we will have the opportunity to visit uh, physically the, the uh, uh, Dianel. The second thing that we can do now is to know what is the, the winner, what, uh, what was the, the winner of the, of the Kahoot. Uh, and uh, bring all together uh, 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 for for the summer school and for the 
for the uh, for finishing <laughs> uh, this uh, first edition of of the of, of of the summer school and of course for the winner as well. So yeah, we need to uh, make a picture. So don't please don't don't. Ah, go. yeah, <laughs> and, and to make a, a picture, uh, uh, drinking, uh, having a drinking. Yeah, make. Also need to thank the wine experts, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure. Thank so you. Uh, Nuria, do you have the 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 winner? Yeah. So I think that uh, Philippa was going to put here a list uh, of the people how it, they scored. So. Um... We have Ghetto in the first place, but he's a speaker, so it doesn't count. On the second place, we have Lan, also, also a speaker. <laughs> On third place, Marta Prado, also a speaker. Sorry, Marta. Fourth place, I have yeah, the Marco. Okay. And the organic PCT girl. We suppose that it's Mireille. Yeah, she is not here at the moment, but I'm sure that she is organizing. <laughs> so our winner is the actually the, the the sixth place. So Mohamed Ali. Yay! The well, winner. Congratulations. So congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. So <laughs> as you know, uh, you can uh, uh, grab your prize here uh, in my office. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, I am joking. We can't. <laughs> we will send, we will send you the, the prize. <laughs> Thank you. Well, but you are, are, I mean, where are you working? Sorry, Mohamed. Um, uh, in Italy, uh, Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore. Okay, so we will, um, we will ask you for your address to send it to you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, all of you, uh, all the speakers, of course. Uh, your engagement was uh, really fantastic. Uh, as well, all the attendees that uh, support uh, this uh, uh, really intensive uh, week. And uh, yes, uh, only remember that uh, uh, Trusted Project uh, continue. Uh, we have other activities planned for, for this year and next uh, summer we will have the second edition of the summer school. I hope that will be physically, presentially, and we will have the opportunity to, to visit INL uh, uh, in a proper way. Okay, so uh, see you uh, and enjoy the, the, the weekend and we keep in touch in the with the web page of Trusted. Also, thank you, bye bye. Maria and Philippa. Thank you. For the thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Bye bye.